Welcome everyone, Questine here with a discussion about the Legendary Lords of Total War, Warhammer 3, Immortal Empires. Gonna start ranking them on a tier list, starting with S tier. Gonna do a number of videos on the subject because this video could genuinely take hours. Otherwise, there's a lot of Legendary Lords to cover. Though I am not going to cover the Wood Elves or the Warriors of Chaos because I think given their campaign situation, they could either be S tier in terms of strength, all of them without exception, or you could put them much lower at D or C uh, because their campaigns are just not much fun. So I'm going to do separate videos or at least a separate video for the Warriors accounts and the Wood Elves. But anyway, for all the other races starting with S tier. First, we have Tyrion. Tyrion has been one of the strongest legendary lords ever since he was introduced in Warhammer 2. And it's interesting that for all the patches, all of the changes, all of the updates, that Tyrion has remained one of the best legendary lords for the High Elves. The High Elves in general have very strong legendary lords. They're a good race. They're an S tier race really powerful and Tyrion's campaign has always worked very very well in Warhammer 2 he was by far and away the best legendary lord to play if you wanted to build a massive empire though Alariel and Alifanar certainly were no slouches Tyrion has always been good there is just something about the legendary lord that's really all about buffing the baseline units of the High Elves as a race. He gets a major upkeep benefit to his own army, he gets major faction-wide benefits. He really works well with a lot of armies of spearmen and archers with light armor, which is the standard of the High Elven armies that you can use throughout the entirety of the campaign. Sure, later on you might want to get some Silvering Guard, you might want to get some Shadow Warriors or uh, Sisters of Avalorn, but uh, Tyrion's main focus in the campaign, which is spearmen, and archers with light armor or archers in general just works exceptionally well. On top of that, because of his starting position, his campaign is fairly straightforward and fairly safe. He doesn't have any major opponent that can stop him for a very long time. I mean, Nakari can be something of an issue if you're playing a very uh, if you're looking to take control over Ulfwan, Nakari can give you some level of challenge, but outside of that, you're not going to face any annoyances, any frustration, any serious challenger. It can be uh, something of a steamroll campaign, but it just works so incredibly well. And it's actually a pretty fun campaign to actually play if you're engaging in a high elf campaign or a campaign in general. Like if you're going to pick up Warhammer Free if you haven't already, this is the first campaign I would recommend for the largest number of players in general. It's just a campaign that works. It's a campaign that works very well. It's a campaign that veterans or new players can pick up and play, and they will have a good time doing so. Then for the Chaos Dwarves, we have Draz of the Ashen. Now, the Chaos Dwarves are a great race, an S tier race, but there's certainly some issues in Zaytan's campaign, and Astrogop just doesn't hold the candle to Draz of. Draz of has major economy benefits through his faction effects and his lord effects. He gets income benefits to armaments, he gets income benefits to materials, he gets income benefits to gold from his settlements. So Drazov is the richest of all of the cast dwarves by far and away, just on those effects alone. But then you add the fact that the Black Fortress, his main starring settlement, he, uh, ha it's a Caffeian caravan, it's the main Caffeian caravan route. So the vast majority of the Caffeian uh, ca uh, factions will be sending caravans through the Black Fortress at one point or another, which will give you a ridiculous amount of gold and a ridiculous amount of labor, which you can also use for gold or you can use to keep fueling your economy. He certainly has a difficult starting position with Emrek, Tretch, Gorsk, Rhesus, Gremgor especially, uh, but it is actually a very fun campaign to play because you have all of the tools needed to succeed. And like all the other cast orbs or cast in general, he has all the climates available in his campaign. I mean, not all of the cast uh, legendary lords have all climate types available. Lakari is an example of that. But uh, the cast dwarves, all of them do have every climate type available. So world domination campaign, if you're going for that, you should play as Drazov. He also starts with a nuclear weapon in the Black Fortress through the prototype Mega Mortar, which is a really powerful ability. Not as powerful as Ica Claw's nukes, but... He can use them in every army and every settlement for free with two charges. So overall, it ends up actually being more useful. And the Chaos Dwarves are just a very well-designed race. Uh, then you have Grimgor, which I would certainly put above both Tyrion and Drazov. Grimgor is insane 
in his campaign. He is one of the best duelists in the game. Yes, his stats, quote unquote, may not be so good, but when you add his uh, his lord effects, his faction effects, his ar uh, his items, you end up with an insanely powerful uh, melee combatant in your army. In fact, Remgor is an absolute nightmare to deal with for every other legendary lord that may start next to him. Because he's very difficult to take down, and because of the greenskin race mechanics, the greenskins can maintain very large armies for very cheap. They have a good economy, they gain a lot of money from looting and sacking settlements. And Grumgor does at least have some caffeine and caravans that will be going through his territory, so even more money. On top of that, he also starts pretty close to Tsar Nagrund. And he can take Tsar Nagrund without resorting to cheese, in the sense that you just build massive armies, you lure the uh, defenders out of Selma because they they think they'll win. You lure them, you fight them in an open field battle, and then you go besiege the capital and deal with the defenders in that capital. It is very doable, very possible. It is, and that gives you an insane level of power because you'll either take it over at tier four or tier uh, tier five. There's apparently a chance that you can take it at tier five, though I'm not sure what that is based on when you're looting and occupying it. By either way, regardless, you will get uh, hero capacity, a significant amount of hero capacity. You'll get all the unit types, or virtually all the unit types very quickly in this campaign, all the hero types. You'll get a ridiculous amount of power, and then you can conquer the world with ease. But it's really fun to play the greenskins. They're very versatile in terms of their unit roster. Uh, they're very versatile in their hero roster. Their legendary lords are great, and Grimgor is currently the best legendary lord of the greenskins. He's certainly a legendary lord that Creative Assembly has, has put a lot of love and care into uh, ever since the rework with Grom in Warhammer 2. And it's interesting to think that he is one of the few legendary lords that were originally released that actually still has a really, really good campaign right now in Warhammer 3. Then we have Deathmaster Snitch. Deathmaster Snitch is a Skaven legendary lord. Skaven are an A tier race, but Snitch is absolutely an S tier legendary lord. He buffs Night Runners and Gut Runners by a significant amount. He has missions that give him food as well as vision with other factions and diplomatic relations and various other benefits with all the other Skaven legendary lords, with the exception of Tretch Craventel, but who cares about Tretch Craventel anyway? So you're going to get a significant amount of power in Snitch's campaign. On top of that, because of the province he starts in and the general area he starts in in Grand Cafe, he has a lot of potential in his campaign. Like you can look at someone like Froth or Ikekla. Yes, they have a lot of power if you're playing, if you're enduring the er the shitty early game that they both have. But Snitch has a great early game and a really good uh, end game as well. Maybe not as good as Ikekla or Froth, who have just more power, but you're Having a strong early game does matter so much in any particular campaign that you are playing. So a great deal of power. And because of all the vision and the diplomatic benefits you're going to get if you're playing Snitch, you may actually end up in a situation where you can confederate all the other legendary lords, with the exception of Tretch, uh, much easier than the other Skaven, uh, than the other Skaven uh, legendary lords can. So that, gives, that can give you even more power in a campaign because the Skaven are spread out around the world. On top of that, because of the schemes, he can get food, he can get income, and he can eliminate faction leaders, which is a ridiculous level of power that you can get in Snitch's campaign. Like, oh, you're dealing with Grimgor in a campaign, he's a problem. No, just completely erase him from the campaign map. You can do that with a scheme. So a ridiculous amount of power. There are downside in the sense that non-Eshian units cost significantly more by default. You can reduce the cost by doing various missions for the various uh, factions of the Skaven. So that is uh, that is a major downside. Another one is that you can't get engineers as easily in uh, Snitch's campaign as you can in other campaigns of the Skaven because you just don't have the right to put a Skaven lab in another city. You lack that right, which is a bit of a shame. But overall, Snitch is a great uh, legendary lord. He's also insanely good in battles. Like he is a really powerful duelist. He gets a lot of uh, ambush success chance. He gets a lot of campaign benefits. He just works incredibly well. Then you have Alifanar. Alifanar is basically what you do when you take a Skaven legendary lord and put them for the high elves, because that's what Alifanar does. He's an ambusher. He has the stock chance, which he can use to attack enemies and get the chance when he's dealing with the field battle, uh, he gets a chance, a pretty good chance, to ambush an enemy. Uh, he has 
a great deal of campaign potential in the short term. It's not the best campaign to play in the long term, though it still can work pretty well. But in the short term, it's probably one of the best campaigns in the entire game. He gets access to the Shadow Walker units, and if you have the Shadow Warriors DLC, he's all focused on Shadow Walkers and Shadow Warriors. He, his own army gets a major upkeep benefit for those units, and suffice it to say, they are substantially better than Archers with Light Armor, and Elif and R may maintain those Shadow Warriors and Shadow Walkers for about the same price as Archers with Light Armor, and have a ridiculous amount of ranged combat strength. Never mind the fact that he might just be ambushing enemies left and right, giving him even more combat strength. And on top of that, he has a Lord skill that gives all uh, range units faction-wide 12% uh, missile strength. And then he has the missions to assassinate certain lords that give him influence, gold, diplomatic relations with high elves and potentially other effects like growth so he's in a really really strong position in terms of action effects lord effects missions he also gets a right that summons an assassin hero that has a hundred percent chance of assassinating uh, any lord or any target thereafter so let's say you're dealing with malika for valka you can just completely remove them from the campaign map of course they're just going to be wounded they're going to recover but let's say you have a difficult battle ahead of you you can just remove that particular threat now he does have a difficult starting position in the sense he's surrounded by dark elves bellacor and silostra so he's got enemies left and right of him but he has all of the tools needed to succeed in his campaign though this is a campaign more designed for veteran players but it is certainly a really great campaign to play. Then you have Morafi, who is the best Dark Elven Legendary Lord by far. She gets Laneshi Corruption, which gives her income benefits and control benefits in her empire. She has a great deal of scalability in her empire. She gets a special control building, which allows her to increase death hag capacity. So she's going to be running around with quite a lot of death hags in her campaign. Not so much uh, in terms of canine assassins, but she does have a great deal of potential. She has an amazingly good starting position with a really great province with four regions, so a lot of income to be gained there. She was already really powerful even before the Dark Elf rework, but now she is by far, in a way, um, one of the best legendary lords in the game. Now, she's not the best in terms of a short campaign, but in terms of a long campaign, Marafi is the best of the Dark Elves by far and away. She is insanely good in battles. She has a powerful army. She gets a good Lord, uh, Lord scale line. She can get Sorceress capacity, so you don't even need to build the Sorceress structure early on in your campaign and still get those magic users. She is a pretty powerful melee combatant. She has a good mount option. She has good items. She's just got the ridiculous amount of power. Like, I've been playing a Morafi campaign just recently, and it's, like, absolutely ridiculous. Like, just to give you an idea of how ridiculous it is, it's, like, what, turn 22 or so, and I've got two full stacks marching on Lawfern, ready to take it out, and then two other stacks marching on north on the north to take out the Leifanar and Silustra by turn 22. That is absolutely ridiculous. You just need to play the diplomacy game with Hexoatl, which is pretty easy to achieve, and then you get a ridiculous level of campaign power. Then uh, then we have Oxyatl. Now, the Lizardmen are a mediocre race, to put it mildly, but Oxyatl is an amazing legendary lord. He has every climate suitable for him, so that gives him a lot of campaign potential. And because of his campaign mechanics that allow him to teleport around the world, he has the ability of just showing up in another territory across the entire map and just conquering it, and no one will be able to beat him back. He gets faction effects for the missions uh, that he's going to get. A lot of money, like his initial mission, which is to just eliminate his initial opponent, a minor coordinate faction, gives him like 5,000 gold. He has, a, he has a very safe starting position. Not so fun as a starting position, but he has only one major opponent there, and that's Kairos. And if you're playing Oxyatl, you will absolutely decimate Kairos Fate Weaver. And then you have every available... Every, uh, part of the world available for you to expand on with no major downsides. He's focused on the skirmisher infantry units. Basically, if you're playing an Axiotl campaign, you might have to fight quite a few more battles than you would normally in a Lizardman campaign, but you will win those battles with minimal casualties. Unless we're talking about sieges, that can obviously be an issue, but Axiotl does have ways of dealing with that. What's even more insane is that he has those sanctums, so you can show up in a region, put down a sanctum, and get... Uh, region-wide benefits or province-wide ben benefits, and you can also put the teleporter stone across the entire campaign map. So let's say you have a mission to deal with um, with Archeon, you can show up, take his capital, and then 
put a sanctum over there so you can uh, come back there to take over that territory when you feel comfortable or just take that territory directly and Archeon is not going to be able to beat you back. What's even worse if you're dealing with Oxyatl, uh, let's say if a, you, you're playing a multiplayer campaign and you're fighting Oxyatl, is he has Blessed Spawnings as a reward for a lot of those missions. Now, Blessed Spawnings are not regiments around now, that Lizardmen have plenty of regiments around now as well. But those Blessed Spawnings are units you can recruit for free instantly. They obviously cost upkeep, but they're just basically better units than the default Lizardmen ones. So let's imagine the scenario. Axiatl shows up in Archeon's capital. Archeon is a really powerful legendary lord. He shows up in his capital, takes it over. Then he recruits another lord. Then he fills that lord with uh, lord's army, regiments of renown, and blessed spawnings, or maybe just blessed spawnings or regiments of renown, because there's so many you can fill a full stack. And then, and so in a single turn, you've got an entire army and another one you just recruited. And then on top of that, you can recruit a third army on the second turn you're there. That is a biblical level of power. You can do that. You can recruit two entire armies, maybe even three armies, very, very quickly in short order of pretty good units. That is the level of Oxyatl's power on the campaign. Then we get Lokir Felhart of the Dark Elves. Well, Morafi is certainly much better in terms of the late game and in terms of empire building. Lokir is ridiculous in terms of the early game potential that his campaign does have. Because Lokir is all about the Black Arcs and the Black Arc Corsairs. He can get more Black Arcs than anyone else because he doesn't need to use a right to do so. He just needs major ports from provincial capitals in order to increase his Black Arc capacity. So he's able to get, like, say, free plus Black Arcs very quickly in his campaign. And Black Arcs are great because they have a major upkeep benefit to the units inside there. So you can build entire stacks and actually take territory. They can attack port settlements. And then if you want to move further inland, you just recruit a lord and transfer the army from the Black Ark to the Lord, then just move that Lord inland to take over territory, and then move it back, move those units back in the Black Ark for the upkeep benefit. He also has a right that gives him a lot of benefits to those Black uh, Ark Corsair units. Black Ark Corsairs are the best early game units for the Dark Elves. Lokir gets a major upkeep benefit with them, and major uh, other benefits to his own army to them, but they're ge generally going to do very, very well in terms of resolve in terms of battle. So he has a really good and powerful early game army and he starts in one of the best areas of the campaign map in cafe he also starts pretty close to sea, a sea lane that allows him to go over to lustria so he can teach rakarf who is the true master of karen car then we have alarial alarial's early game campaign is not that great I feel, but in terms of late game potential, Al Alarial is the best of the High Elves and one of the best Legendary Lords in the entire game. What makes her so strong is her handmaidens, her faction effects, her lord skills. She gets a lot of handmaiden capacity. She can get more handmaidens faster than anyone else. She also gets faction-wide benefits if she takes control over Wolf One. She does have downsides if, if from the start of her campaign, if any bit of Wolf One is not under High Elven control, but once it is, you're going to get a ridiculous level of growth, control, income, and leadership to your armies. And High Elves are already pretty strong by default. You add in those benefits that Alarial has, it becomes really powerful. And then you add the Handmaiden benefit. You can increase Handmaiden capacity at Tier 3 as opposed to Tier 4 for every other Legendary Lord of the High Elves. And those handmaidens, every single handmaiden can buff your diplomatic relations with all factions by 2, can give you 1 influence, 5% income from trade tariffs, and very importantly, control faction. So you're you're getting a huge diplomatic benefit. You're getting a trade tariff benefit. So diplomacy with trade tariffs go hand in hand. And you get influence, which allows you to recruit higher quality heroes, higher quality lords throughout your campaign. Alarial is absolutely ridiculous in her campaign. And she can recruit tree spirits only from one structure, from one landmark that only she can use when you're playing her campaign from the Gay and Vale. But the fact she can recruit tree kin and tree men gives her an absurd level of power. And then finally, for S tier, the final lord I'm putting it here at S tier, with the exception of Warriors of Chaos and Wood Elves, is Azag the Slaughter. Grom has issues in the long term. Skarsnik is, well, pathetic. Warzak has uh, his own issues. Um, but I would certainly say uh, Azag is an S tier legend lord. He's not as ridiculous as Grimgor is right now, but before. Before the Forge of the Cast Wars, I would have said that playing Azak's campaign was actually better. 
than Grimgor because you could because you could let Grimgor do his own thing, conquer a lot of territory, and then show up, beat them, and take over that entire territory for yourself. Yeah, that's the benefit in a greenskin campaign. You can just have others do your work for you. But Azag is still a really powerful legendary lord. Grimgor has just been mega buffed with the Forge of the Cast Dwarfs, difference, the better starting position, etc. But here's the thing about Azak. He starts in a relatively safe starting position, and he has only minor enemies to deal with. On top of that, he can colonize the Empire. And the Imperial factions at the moment are pretty pathetic to deal with, so it's very, very easy to take vast chunks of the Empire and let Grimgor, Skarsenik, Warzak do their own thing and then show up and confederate them uh, very, very easily uh, in your campaign. Or help Skarsenik to deal with Ungram specifically, or deal with Ungram yourself, you also get the diplom diplomacy benefit with the Vampire Count, so you can make an alliance with Vlad if you're so inclined, and just go to dominate the Empire, Greenskins and Vampires hand in hand. Um, Azak is really powerful also because he has a sacking uh, benefit to a race that already gets a ridiculous amount of income from sacking settlements by default. So he gets, what, 20% income from sacking settlements. He has more climate types than the other green scan legendary lords. He is absolutely absurd. Like, Grom is better in terms of action effects, but he's limited by climate. Azak is not as limited by climate, so he has a lot of potential. He's also a priest, a strong fighter in his own right. Not as strong as Grimgor, but still fairly strong all the same. And that is it. Those are the S-tier legendary lords in the game at the moment from my perspective. I mean, there are certainly others that you could uh, count, like you could consider Helmut Gorst or Vlad von Karstein, but if there were legendary lords, if there were campaigns, I would say, like, these are the most powerful legendary lords, these are the guys that have the most campaign potential, these guys have the best campaigns overall, it would be the legendary lords on this list. And I think those kind of things do count. It's not just about strength, it's about how good are the campaigns to play again and again and again? How much potential do you have in those campaigns? How What level of frustration are you going to feel? And the Legendary Lords that I've just listed here, I think just have overall the best campaigns at the moment in the game. Now we move on to A tier. Now I want to be clear, just because a race might be S tier, doesn't mean that all the Legendary Lords of that race deserve an S tier spot. It depends on their campaign, the, their Lord effects, their faction effects. So anyway, moving on to A tier is Ikeclaw, the first one that I want to mention. Ikeclaw has a great deal of campaign potential but in the long term. His problem is that his starting position really is terrible in a lot of ways. Yes, there are some landmarks, there are resources nearby, but it's very difficult to defend, it's very difficult to progress. In fact, the best thing you can do is, with the exception of Skaven Blight itself, of course, is you should abandon it, head over to Camry, conquer a bunch of territory there, build up a massive economy, and then head back there. But of course, in the long term, Ekekla has an enormous amount of potential because he can literally build nuclear weapons, and like other Skaven Legendary Lords, he has a great deal of climate adaptability, or climate suitability, rather. So he does have certainly a lot of power, but early on, it is certainly a fairly rough spot. On top of that, Rallying Gunners and Gisales just don't do very well right now unless you have a really good battlefield, which does limit his campaign potential. If those things were, would be fixed, and if he had, if his starting position wasn't so miserable, he would certainly be an S-tier legendary, uh, legendary Lord, but at the moment he's an A-tier one. Then we go to Grom the Paunch. Now, Grom the Paunch, in terms of faction effects, Lord effects, campaign, uh, just just the sheer insanity that he does have in his early game campaign, Grom would definitely be an S tier legendary lord. But the problem is, the major problem in Grom's campaign is while he certainly has a great deal of power, and crucially, he can colonize all of Ulfwan because it is suitable climate, he runs into the issue is that a lot of the terrain around him besides Ulfwan is not suitable climate, so he's going to have severe limitations in his campaign. Like, you're going to have a lot of fun in a Grom the Paunch campaign. He is A tier. A tier is not bad by any stretch of imagination, but you're going to run into the issue that while you might have a lot of fun playing his campaign, and his camp faction effects are so powerful, you may deal with the entire campaign in unsuitable climate, you're going to encounter the situation where your campaign potential is limited just because of climate, because outside of Wolfwan, the only other climate that's suitable lies pretty far to the 
east that does require you to traverse a good amount of territory from your starting position. So that's not a great situation to deal with in any campaign. But otherwise, Grom is a fantastic legendary lord, and I've greatly enjoyed playing his campaign again and again. Uh, then we have the high priest of Hashut himself, Astrogoth Ironhand. Now, Astrogoth is cool from a design perspective, but from a legendary lord perspective, he does leave some things to be desired. See, the problem with Astrogoth, it's not that he's bad, it's just that he's kind of designed as a generic legendary lord, at least in terms of his faction effects, like he's the legendary lord for, for beginners if they're picking up the Chaos Dwarfs. Like, every race has, like, a generic lord that doesn't have anything special necessarily going for them. Astrogoth does have a focus on centaurs, to be clear, and that is certainly very, very, very powerful, but he's more useful to confederate than he is to play because his faction effects when you are playing him are limited. And he has a rough start because you're, he's going to encounter Grimgor the earliest in a lot of ways of the Chaos War Dwarves. And he's going to have to deal with him the earliest because Grimgor is in his natural expansion path. I mean, you could decide to do things differently, but you're just setting up yourself for failure if you decide to ignore Grimgor. That is difficult. But I'd say the biggest problem in, uh, in Astrogoth's campaign is that his faction effects, his items... And even his Lord Skelet line don't hold a candle to what Drazov offers overall. I mean, Drazov is rich beyond comparison because of all the cafe and caravans that are going through his territory. Astrogoth is not. And uh, Drazov increases unit helps increase unit capacity for all units, but also increases it for Kadai and Infernal um, Iron and Infernal Guard and Iron Sworn by quite a bit. Draz, uh, uh, Astrogoth is focused on centaurs, but he just doesn't have the economic potential that Drazov has. So he's just a lesser legendary lord because of that. Then we have Malice Darkblade, the edgy uh, dark elf legendary lord uh, incarnate. Uh, Malice is one of the most powerful melee combatants, if not the most powerful melee combatant in the entire game. He is absolutely insane. He also starts with the Black Arc, which only Lokir does, so he has a lot of early game potential, especially because he starts in the Chaos Waste fighting demons, and he will absolutely annihilate them. Then he gets a major growth benefit in his campaign if he removes the position, so he can build a massive empire very, very quickly. Now, the thing that... I would take away from his campaign is that overall he's in a strong uh, spot, but here's the problem. There are a couple of issues. One, every other army that he has that's going to march across the northern castway, sorry, castway in general, is going to take attrition. Two, because you're you're exposed to the coastline, so you're going to end up in a war with Norska and have to deal with them. You will easily smash them to pieces, but it's going to be difficult between traversing the terrain, taking attrition damage, and you ha don't have an encamp stance as the Dark Elves. Uh, to prevent that attrition, all you can do is enable a raiding stance, but obviously a raiding stance ca carries with it certain penalties if you're doing it in your own territory. So it's not a great situation for the Dark Elves to deal with that kind of territory in general, and Malice will have to deal with that territory. But otherwise, he will certainly smash uh, smash everyone's face in that he's dealing with in his campaign. Like, he goes up to Sigvold and absolutely destroys him. Same with Valkia. And to the east, all he has is the Demon Prince, who is just a really pathetic challenger if he even ends up being a challenge in any way, shape, or form. So a great deal of power in his campaign, but kind of a bit boring really to just spend like the first 20, 30 turns just fighting minor demonic factions that you're just going to walk all over them and then encountering Sigvald, which by that point, by the point you encounter Sigvald, you're just going to walk over him as well. So certainly some issues with the way the campaign is designed. I mean, the Castways is a great area of the campaign map in terms of building an empire, but it is pretty boring at the moment. Then we have Elfarian. Elfarian's campaign can be pretty interesting because one, he has a great deal, he has a good amount of climate suitability, at least in the Badlands. So you have a unique High Elven campaign in the sense that you have a Badlands campaign or you can go into the mountains and fight the dwarves if you so desire. Um, but mainly you're going to be fighting greenskins. So that's uh, absolutely a un unique perspective. What's also interesting about Elfarian is that he has two different 
uh, starting position. Like he has an army just out the coast of Balance, but he also starts with Tor of Rest. So does Malice, but in Malice's case, you don't really care about the settlement you start with. You, it's generally better to sell it for a huge amount of money. But in Elfarian's case, you do have a choice. You can give Tor of Rest to Tyrion for a huge amount of money or keep it and try and fight two concurrent campaigns at the same time with two different armies. Can be pretty brutal, but if you do succeed in it, you will have a great deal of campaign power. On top of that, Elfarian has a bunch of unique units that are only available if you're playing his campaigns, the Mist units which are quite very powerful units. Not necessarily the most powerful in the High Elven roster, but you can buff them up to an extreme amount. You can also capture lords and legendary lords in battles and interrogate them. And when you are interrogating them, you can also buff the Mistwalker units, but you can then set those lords free. In that case, you'll gain the ability of, you'll, you'll be able to siphon off a certain portion of that faction's income for your own gain. So Elfarian can get a huge amount of money during the course of his campaign doing this. He is pretty powerful, but he's just not quite on the same level of Tyrion, Elifanar, or Alariel, I'd argue. And he certainly has the heart of this campaign out of all of them if you want to reach his maximum potential. And that means fighting two concurrent campaigns at the same time, which can be pretty brutal if you're considering the situation in Wolf 1. Uh, then we have Zaytan the Black. Now, Zaytan has a lot of campaign potential, has a lot of climate suitability as a cast dwarf legendary lord, has a lot of things to like. Like, he is the master of labor, he'll gain more labor overall in his campaign than anyone else. So that is a huge amount of money, that is a huge amount of power in his campaign. What's the problem? His starting position is honestly terrible. You're going to waste so much time in this campaign. And the thing is, you've got Grimgore to your rear, and while you may not encounter Grimgore initially, you will certainly encounter him after a certain period of time. And the problem is Grimgore is going to attack you from behind while you want to expand toward in front of you to deal with Village, to deal with Cafe, to take that territory to March and Cafe. Or victory conditions require you to deal with Miao Ying. But in the backside, you've got an endgame crisis that's chasing after you. And here's the thing about the Castorf campaign. Castorfs especially are vulnerable to losing certain bits of territory. And this is one of the problems in Zaytan's campaign. On top of that, both Drazif and Astrogoth start with the tier 2 capital. You start with the tier 1 capital with the quote unquote benefit being that you start with two settlements. Well, I'll be honest, starting with two uh, tier one settlements as the Chaos Dwarves is one of the worst things that can happen in your campaign. So it's not really much of an upside when you're playing Zaytan's campaign in Immortal Empires. He does have a good amount of power if you are willing to endure until the mid late game, but he's certainly the worst uh, Chaos Dwarf campaign to play at the moment, though he does have a pretty good amount of power on the campaign map. Then we have both Isabella and Vlad von Karstein, and yes, I'm going to certainly rank them uh, on the same level, both A tier. I would say Isabella is just very slightly better to play to pick as the Legendary Lord, because both of them start in the same starting position, with the same Salmons, same hero. It's just the choices, who's the Legendary Lord, who's the Legendary Hero in the campaign. Uh, Picking Isabella as the Legendary Lord is the better choice because her faction effects are just better, but otherwise you're going to get the same Lord effects regardless of who you choose. Uh, picking Isabella is also better because Vlad will then start with his items from, from the beginning. Sure, you won't gain as much money as you would for the quest battles, but at the same time, this basically means Vlad is at a very high potential from the beginning of your campaign, and that makes him absolutely insane as a hero. And very very powerful. Both Isabella and Vlad are incredible fighters, especially together in the same army because they get a bonus effect when together. So both of them really powerful, great deal of diplomatic potential in this campaign. Like you can vassalize Ungram, you can vassalize a bunch of factions, you can make alliances left and right, and you can deal uh, with a lot of different factions. And certainly the best campaign, I would say, for the Vampire Counts in terms of fun factor, starring position, just overall enjoyment from my perspective. Uh, then we have Hellebron. Now, this might surprise you. A lot of think, a, a lot of people have a poor opinion of Hellebron, but I think she has an enormous amount of potential in her campaign. Not as much as Morafi, but you got to consider she starts also starts with a four 
region province, then she has a bunch of other provinces near her that are suitable climate, which is something Marafi doesn't have in her campaign. So she can build a massive an economy very quickly. She probably has the most difficult time at getting a black arc in her campaign, so that is a downside. But at the same time, she also has quite a few upsides as well. She starts with the death hack, for instance, which gives her replenishment from the very beginning of her campaign. And while the blood host mechanic doesn't work very well, the actual meter, if you keep it full, full, will give you a lot of benefits. Hellbron certainly benefits from Dark Elf rework in the sense that Slave Cap has been removed, so she no longer has an issue in terms of just maintaining a lot of slaves in her campaign for her special right. So right now, she is actually quite very strong. Not necessarily the best in battle of the Dark Elf Legendary Lords, but still a very powerful Legendary Lord to play. Certainly much better than Malekith, who starts next to her. Uh, then we have Fronton Clean. Fronton Clean is, like Ikaclaw, a very powerful Legendary Lord if you manage to deal with his early game. But here's the thing, the difference between the two of them. Ikaclaw has a lot of enemies, but the territory that's actually near him is actually useful. Frot's, the, the territory of Kislev that Frot starts next to U is utterly worthless. And Norska isn't that much better because a lot of Norska is chaotic wasteland, which isn't suitable for Skaven. So Frot has a lot of issues in his campaigns and in, in campaign in starting off. And on top of that, Ikeclaw flat out starts with a better army and a nuclear weapon. So in a lot of ways, Ikeclaw is much, much better. Frot does have a lot of individual unit customization. He can also spawn units through the vats very powerful monster units in his campaign to gain a significant amount of power. But it's certainly the kind of campaign that, that takes a lot of time to get going. And I would say for Skaven, the one of the main benefits in a Skaven campaign is your initial starting situation. But make no mistake, Frot is a pretty powerful legendary lord all the same. Then we have Prince Emmerich of the High Elves. High Elves are one of the most powerful races, as I've uh, said. And Emmerich certainly has a good deal of power. The problem with him, like all these other Legend Lords, or virtually all of them, is that his starting position isn't that great. I mean, when I look at these Legend Lords, actually, the only one that, they're like, the only two um, that have good starting positions are Astrogoth and uh, Hellebron, I mean, Vlad kind of has a good starting position, but can also blow up in your face. For Emmerich, the problem is that the High Elves depend heavily on trade in order to gain a lot of campaign power or to fuel their economy. Emmerich doesn't really have trading partners for quite a good portion of his campaign, and his objective to take a Kalidor actually just sucks. You should start at least the campaign with it, and it should be easier to achieve, but it is really annoying. You also have to spend influence to get it done in the proper fashion, because you want diplomatic benefit to offset the confederation diplomatic cost. You do want to confederate Kalidor because you want to sell the territory to Tarion and get the major diplomatic benefit. Or maybe you want to keep it and just use a secondary army to kill Noctilus. It is very, very possible because the Vampire Coast army just sucks that much. Uh, there's a lot of potential in this campaign and the Mega Dragons that Emmerich has access to certainly will give him a lot of power to use throughout the course of his campaign. But at the same time, the isolation in his campaign is certainly going to hurt him quite a bit. Bit, though he does have plenty of suitable climate, at least uh, around him, so that's not going to be a problem. And the Darklands right now are one of the best areas in the on the campaign map. Then we go to Warzag of uh, the Greenskins. The issue I would say that exists with Warzag is that he's pretty generic as a Legend Lord for the Greenskins. Yes, he has a bit of a Savage Orc benefit and his campaign, but you generally don't want to use Savage Orcs unless we're talking about Warzak's army. Warzak is the kind of legendary lord that's pretty outdated because he was designed in an era where we would have limited armies, so having effects that would really buff an army as opposed to the faction worked in that period of Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2. But when Warhammer 3, it's all about the faction-wide benefits. Warzak has some pretty sweet benefits for the Savage Orcs in his army, but not so much on a faction-wide level, and that is the downside of his campaign. So basically, if you're playing Warzag, you're kind of playing a generic legendary lord of the greens, because like, you're basically playing a generic lord with one savage orc army. That's effectively Warzag in a nutshell, and 
his campaign. I mean, he is a pretty powerful caster and it does work and it works better than Skarsnik. Yes, I, I'm going to go there. It actually works better than Skarsnik to play a generic Lord than to play Skarsnik as the Greenskins because the Greenskins are ultimately still a, fair, a fairly powerful race. But compared to like Grom or Grimgor or Azag, I would not necessarily recommend this campaign very highly. Uh, then we have Queek Head Taker. Queek Head Taker, like all other scaly Vanillarian lords, he's a pretty powerful lord, with the exception of Tretch, but that's a different discussion. Uh, Queek is a monster in melee combat, like Snitch. He doesn't have the same faction effects as Snitch does, so he's falling behind because he's not a DLC Legendary Lord, so he's weaker than all the others, but he does have one advantage. He has an amazing starting position that's very easily defendable with a lot of settlements close together, so you can use the underway to go hop from settlement to settlement if you ever come under attack. And crucially, you can build a massive uh, economy very quickly in his campaign. So that gives him a lot of campaign potential, and whereas if you're playing Ikeclaw or Fraught, you're just going to spend a lot of that early game feeling extremely frustrated. Not the case in Queek's campaign. If there is any downside in Queek campa Queek's campaign, is not that it sucks in any way, it's that, yeah, he's the generic Ledger Lord for the Skaven, and because of that, he isn't as great as the DLC Ledger Lords, because pay, pay DLC is, uh, it generally creates better Ledger Lords. Then we have Heinrich Kemmler. Kemmler is a bit of a, a, a bit of a ridiculous Ledger Lord in quite a few ways. He's a lot stronger than you might assume. While he doesn't have the same kind of melee combat potential as Isabella and Vlad, he certainly has a really a huge amount of a campaign potential. He can raise the dead far cheaper than anyone else in any Vampire Count campaign. His faction effects work, his starting position actually has a lot more potential than you might assume, and he does have a decent amount of climate suitability as well, because he can take over mountains as an example. Uh, and the crazy thing is about his starting position is that he can actually get a lot of blood kisses as well because the main way to get that, those in a Warhammer free Immortal Empires campaign is the Vampire Counts is to eliminate faction leaders. Guess what Kemmler has around him? A bunch of minor factions with faction leaders that he can eliminate for blood kisses to get those special lords for the Vampire Counts at the moment. So because of that, he actually has a good amount of campaign power. Far more so than I might have realized, like, if you're playing Kemmler's campaign, you can vassalize Grom the Paunch within like four or five turns. And suffice it to say, Grom the Paunch is a ridiculously powerful Legendary Lord, and you can have him as a vassal that is absurdly strong. You can vassalize Carl Franz or Lewin Leonker, and also get the Red Duke. Another advantage is that you start pretty close to the Red Duke, so you could potentially confederate them. Though, if you do vassalize a bunch of factions near you, chances are you're going to piss off the Red Duke, so maybe just play with the Defeat the Legendary Lord's mod to get access to him easier. Uh, then we have Lord Skrulk of the Skaven, who starts off in Illustria. He's actually a, a lot stronger than you might assume. Quick is just better uh, than he is. Uh, like, when I look at Lord Skrulk, a lot of people misunderstand just the sheer potential that he does have in his particular campaign. He actually can just annihilate everyone else in Lestria. And crucially, unlike the other Legendary Lords or many other Skaven Legendary Lords, he actually can have allies in his campaign. One of the problems in Skaven campaigns is that you don't have allies because everyone hates you. Well, Skrulk starts near two minor Skaven factions. One of them will be wiped out off after turn one unless you trade them a territory it there will be wiped off uh, by the cult of so uh, sotek but you can trade them a territory to keep them alive and get training partners diplomatic allies that will help you in your campaign to conquer lustra a great deal and he also starts with two artillery pieces which is pretty substantial in its own right then we have malekith certainly towards the bottom tier of the Eight tier Legendary Lords, but he's still a Dark Elf Legendary Lord, even if his campaign is incredibly limited. I mean, Malekith's campaign suffers from the fact of terrain, from the terrain issue, because he does have to deal with the Skaven, at least, that are in the mountains, though he might want to sell that territory to make an alliance with Grom Brindle. How long that's going to last is difficult to say, but you can certainly make a deal work with Grom Brindle. But there's absolutely a lot of problems. You start with the tier 1 settlement. In comparison, just to give you an idea, Marafi and Hellebron start with the tier 2 settlement. 
and Malice Darkblade to have such a biblical amount of money and growth in his campaign from the very beginning that he might as well start with the tier 3 element, really, for all intents and purposes. So you have a very limited campaign as Malekith, though Malekith is absolutely very strong as a legendary lord, though I would argue that he certainly falls in that category where he's better to confederate than he is to actually play in his campaign. Uh, especially now, starting with the tier 2 settlement is actually so significant because it means you can, with the rush construction mechanic that the Dark Elves now have, you can start recruiting Dark Shards of Shields from the very beginning. Something that Malakif can't do. He also doesn't start with the Black Arc like Malice or Lokir do. And then finally, uh, the worst legendary lord of the Dark Elves, Rakarf. Rakarf is still a pretty powerful legendary lord, but I'd say his campaign is the worst campaign of the Dark Elves at the moment. Focusing on the monstrous units just doesn't work very well because the, up, the kind of benefits that he does have for them just aren't worth it that much. Like if you're playing a Dark Elf campaign, it's still much better to go with Dark Shards and Black Heart Corsairs than to bother with the monster units. Maybe a couple of them, but outside of that, where Karf, what you're getting is as close to a generic Lord for the Dark Elves as you can get even more generic than Malekith, who is supposed to fill that role. Because Malekith does have quite a few unique mechanics and Lord effects that work for him. Rakarf isn't bad, but he's just the least interesting Dark Elf campaign at the moment. And then we have Helm and Gorst to round up, uh, round up this particular list of A-tier legendary lords. What's my issue with Gorst? Well, here's what I would argue on this particular subject. Gorst is powerful, incredibly powerful. Like if we're just going to talk about strength he could easily be considered an STR Legendary Lord, but his starting position sucks because he's surrounded by Cafe, Greasis, and Kugaf, and then now Drazov. So he's got to deal with a bunch of enemies, but that's not necessarily a problem because Gorst has the cheapest armies of the Vampire Counts that are actually still effective. Here's the thing. I don't care about power in isolation. I think that when you're doing lists, you shouldn't just care about power in isolation. I think a lot of people would agree with the sentiment that Gorst's campaign is absolutely awful, awful to play, even if he does have a significant amount of power. The reason it's awful to play is because while his zombies are insanely buffed and insanely powerful as a resolve, uh, result of it, it is pretty damn boring to just go into a battle and spend a significant amount of time just waiting for zombies to eventually kill everything because they can't be killed themselves. So it's not a great campaign to play um, from that perspective. He does make it work, but it's the most awful vampire uh, counts campaign to play. What about Manfred, you might ask? Well, let's just say Manfred doesn't really have any faction effects to speak of. Books on the Gash sucks. Like, He's got a lot of issues. Gorst still wins out. He still deserves an A-tier spot because he's still very, very powerful. I would certainly not rank him S-tier, however, because he has a, he has such an awful campaign situation. But the power is there. I just have to deduct points because of how awful it is to actually play his campaign. We're moving on to B-tier. We've already covered S and A-tier. So these are the lords as I see them right now in the game at the moment, based on their campaigns, their strength, uh, just everything, how it all plays together. It's not enough from my perspective to just have a huge amount of power if like, the terrain around your campaign is completely terrible or your campaign just sucks. Either way, moving on to B tier, the first one, it is going to be Arkan the Black. Now, while I certainly don't necessarily have a uh, high opinion of the Tomb Kings, Arkan is a pretty powerful legendary lord. And while his campaign may get pretty boring as you are going to steamroll completely out of control fairly quickly, it is fun to play the Tomb Kings in quite a lot of ways. It is fun to play a faction or a race that just has disposable armies. The problem in Tomb Kings campaigns, though, for the most part, is the fact that their early game situation is very, very limited. It made sense in Warhammer 2 where, you know, having a full stack of units for, let's say, 15 turns was not really too much of an issue. But in Warhammer 3, it is a major issue. But Arkhan does have a lot of advantages to overcome that in the sense that he starts with an extra army from the very beginning and he has a bunch of unique units. I'd say he's a bit 
too strong at the moment in the sense that between the unique units he gets in his campaign as well as the start of the extra army he's just going to completely obliterate his opposition but certainly can be a very fun and enjoyable campaign if if you're up for it then we have Tarox, the Brass Bull, for the Beastmen. I don't necessarily think the Beastmen right now, as a race as a whole, are in a great spot. In the sense that, right now, Warhammer 3 is all about the early game. It's not necessarily so much about, like, past turn 40, 50. And the Beastmen early game can suffer a significant amount. Especially for Tarox, he has a fairly difficult starting position. Though they have made it easier with the recent uh, pat with some of the recent patches. Here's the thing, though. If you do overcome that difficult early game and you start getting regiments right now and you start getting the more powerful units, you have a campaign that has a huge amount of potential in it. You just have to overcome the initial challenges, deal with things like Silostra, Leaf and R, etc., but if you manage it, and it is a pretty big if, I imagine, for a lot of people, then you certainly will have a blast of a campaign where you're just going to fight a lot of battles every single turn. I would not necessarily recommend this campaign for people um, that don't enjoy fighting a lot of battles manually, because that's exactly what you should be doing in this campaign, fighting a lot of battles manually every single turn to maximize the potential that you do have. Uh, then we have Skarsnik B tier as well. It says a lot about Skarsnik that the Greenskins are one of the best races in the game at the moment, that he's a B tier legendary lord, but he's kind of pathetic. The problem is that while he has a major goblin benefit in terms of upkeep, though he doesn't have the goblin tide skill line himself, which is actually a pretty significant downside because without the goblin tide, your nasty skulkers have significantly less armor, you want to use nasty skulkers. And so because of that situation, you're going to end up being far more limited in terms of um, in terms of like his own army potential. But yeah, you can recruit a bunch of goblin uh, gray shamans as lords and give them the goblin tide. They'll actually do better in battle than Skarsnik will because of the extra armor. They're going to give the goblin archers and the nasty skulkers, not night goblins to be uh, specific. I think Night Goblins could use that benefit at the moment, at least their melee units could, because there's virtually no reason to use them in a campaign at the moment. Uh, but here's the problem in Skarsnik's campaign. While he certainly can dominate in the early game, he's going to have a lot of issues in the late game. The reason he's going to have a lot of issues is simply because he can only recruit Orc units from Carrick 8 Peaks. And it's not like, oh, you take Carrick 8 Peaks, you get uh, Orc Recruitment. If that was the case, Garstink would be much higher on this uh, tier list. No, you can only recruit uh, Orc units from that particular settlement. And it's a settlement in a province with two regions. While Greenskins have a lot of recruitment capacity in general, uh, they do require a decent number of regions, like three, four regions in a province in order to fully utilize that. Whereas Carrick 8 Peaks, it's in a province with only two settlements, so it ends up being fairly limited as a result of that in terms of unit recruitment. And the structure that allows you to recruit um, Orc units takes a long, long time to build, which is an anomaly for the Greenskins because they generally build things very fast and very cheap, not so much for Skarsnik's Orc recruitment. And not being able to recruit Orcs does cause a lot of issues in the long term of your campaign because while Nasty Skulkers are great in the early game for like 30, 40 turns, they stop being as useful much later on as you're encountering much better units in a campaign. So you do need the Orc units. Like... The Greenskins have great unit variety. Skarsnik just has less unit variety in his campaign because he can only recruit Orc units from that one settlement. And he's not a great melee factor. His faction effects, like, basically, it just boils down to the major upkeep benefit that he does have for goblins. Everything else is kind of meaningless in a lot of ways. Uh, then we have Manfred. Uh, Manfred is a vampire counts legendary lord that basically has no faction effects outside of the Books of Nagash. The problem with that is the Books of Nagash suck. The entire system sucks. Say what you will about the Tomb Kings, they're not reliant on the Books of Nagash to have faction effects, whereas Manfred does. So Manfred has a fairly limited campaign. He has a difficult starting position. He's surrounded by enemies. He doesn't even have a special uh, uh, a Lord skill line. He just has two different 
schools of magic it's like okay that's great uh how about some faction effects like vlad and isabella do or gorst does or kemler does nope manfred doesn't have that he he is basically playing a generic uh, lord for the vampire counts he is designed to be the generic lord i guess he in a lot of ways he's the ultimate generic lord in the sense he had literally is as bland as you can imagine him he's also a despicable character in the lore for many many reasons but while i certainly think the vampire counts always have a lot of potential in their campaigns manfred is just the worst campaign at the moment for the vampire counts at least if you're looking at world domination look say what you will about gorst it's his zombie play style sucks but you don't have to play with zombies if you don't want to as gorst it makes sense to play as with zombies or you can do a combination of music. You get some zombies, you get some grave guard, and it ends up working pretty well in your campaign. And Gorst has other benefits outside of the zombies, believe it or not. Because he ultimately is an necromancer. Manfred doesn't really have anything except the Books of Nagash. And as I stated, the Books of Nagash has a system just to suck. Then we have Xiao Ming of Grand Cafe. Xiao Ming is a pretty powerful Legend Lord. He gets an armor bonus faction wide, so he does better in Aut Resolve. He gets a caravan bonus, so he's going to earn more money. He's in a pretty good uh, campaign situation overall. Uh, he does have a lot on offer. He does. Uh, he also gets a diplomatic relations benefit with Greasus effectively through his Lord Skin line. So he's just a better campaign to play than his sister in every way possible, given the current meta. In Realms of Chaos, this was exactly the opposite, but that was mainly due to the fact that Xiao, uh, Miao Ying's AI couldn't handle this, the fact that Snake, it, uh, Snake 8 was open and the uh, invasion of demons and Norskins that were coming through the Great Bastion. So playing his campaign was much more difficult in Realms of Chaos and far more limited, but that situation has been reversed. Playing his campaign right now is just much easier and better in a significant number of ways than Miao Ying. And he just will end up having ridiculous levels of armor on his units in their army, which does help a great deal. Uh, then we have Rapunz, the Leoness for Bretonia. Bretonia is kind of one of those weird races in the game in the sense that they have a lot of things to like. They have a great economy, good growth, actually one of the highest, if not the highest growth, rates in the game they can get, earn a lot of money for sacking and looting settlements they have good uh, hero options limited as they are but they are still pretty powerful their cavalry is the best in the game they have early game artillery so what's not, they're not to like well their infantry and range line sucks in a fairly significant amount and bretonia does struggle in sieges that's why bretonia is a limited faction but her pants actually is in a pretty powerful uh, situation. Uh, she's not limited in terms of confederation with other Bretonian factions the way every other Bretonian legendary lord is. She has a special research tree. As a result of that, she can confederate normally, which actually ends up working far better than it does in every other Bretonian campaign. She also has a really good starting position, which is fairly well protected from various threats, especially if you deal with Arkhan pretty quickly and make an alliance with the Dwarves, who the Dwarves, minor factions in general, aren't great allies, but Dwarven factions do make for great allies in a campaign, just because the Dwarven army is incredibly powerful and the AI does get benefits. Even if it's a minor faction, it still gets benefits you're looking at. Uh, the minor door faction you start ne next to will have like two full stacks of units that will do pretty well and they will help you out in your campaign. Uh, then we have Miao Ying of Grand Cafe. She just has a worse campaign, less money, a worse starting situation, worse like in, in every way. Like Nan Gao might seem a great situation, but look at Xiao Ming. Xiao Ming literally... Um, starts with the barracks and minor settlement which is the ideal scenario because while it's as defensible it's like you have building slots for the provincial capital meow ying starts with her with her barracks and the provincial capital in nangao and the nangao province is not as good as yao ming just far more lim a far more limited situation also meow ying suffers because you might have to go over the great bastion to deal with the chaos factions though you may not have to but it is annoying to have village run around the mountains more to attack you in the side when you're when you're trying to deal with Lokir and Snitch. That can happen for Xiao Ming as well, absolutely. But I would just say Miao Ying at the moment is worse off than her brother in a campaign. Like she just doesn't get that armor benefit, that caravan benefit, lots uh 
quite a few issues. Though it should be noted, Cafe is in the trouble spot in the sense that they don't have great replenishment. The compass sucks, and the climate suitability that they have in a campaign is fairly limited. Uh, then we have uh, the Fey Enchantress. Now, the Fey Enchantress, if you're going to play a Bretonian campaign in Bretonia, I would certainly recommend the Fey Enchantress versus Luan Luan Kor. It's not because she's better than Luan. She's not. But Luan's starting position is far, far worse than hers. Like, you'll constantly get attacked by Bellacor. Whereas she might have to deal with Snitch, sure, and Grom, but believe it or not, she is quite capable of doing it. She gets extra peasants from the very beginning. She gets units of Grail Guardians. She has good relations with the Wood Elves. Those are all advantages that do end up working pretty well in her campaign. There are certainly problems. She's still limited in Confederation, etc. But I would say, like, if you're playing a Bretonian campaign in Bretonia, she's the one I would recommend. Then we have Albrecht. I want to like Albrecht. A lot of people don't for obvious reasons, and I understand exactly why. Like, going on a Knight's Crusade as Bretonia might seem like a great idea. Rapunzel has a Crusader campaign, except the problem is Albrecht, to get his quest weapon, has to go for Sartosa, and then he is limited in terms of his diplomacy, and navigating Lustria is always an issue because it's slower and you have a lot of factions and you have a... It's still kind of a Thunderdome there, though it is one dominated by the Lizardmen at the moment, but still lots of issues over there. And you're going to have to choose in your campaign who are you going to ally. You can ally Mar Marcus Wolfhard, though then enjoy fighting Hexoatl, Gorak, and the Cult of Sotek. That's a fun experience, I gotta tell you. Um, but yeah, Bretonia, I don't think is well so at all for the kind of jungle warfare that Lustria has to offer. Though Albrecht's campaign can work and he can get the vows unlocked pretty quickly, which is a benefit that Rapunzel also has. One of the problems in Bretonian campaigns is actually unlocking the vows for lords and heroes. Well, because you're in the jungle, you can actually do that easier because it's the second vow that's generally the problem because you need to win a siege in a desert or a jungle. Guess where you are? You're in a jungle. Then we have Tretch, Craventel of the Skaven. Tretch is not awful, but he's the worst of the Skaven legendary lords. Skaven are a pretty good race, lots of potential, lots of early game aggression. Tretch just buffs Storm Vermin and Skaven slaves. And oh, he gets Vanguard deployment for a race that has significant Vanguard deployment benefits for a lot of its units. Ooh, yay, that's great. I mean, I guess you can move the artillery closer to the front line. It just doesn't end up working as well as you might think. I mean, you can play a campaign at Strange and you can certainly win it, but like compared to every other Legendary Lord of the Skaven, yeah, Tretch is far, far behind. And I say this as someone who has played this campaign. People wanted me to play this campaign. I've played it. He is still an awful, it is still an awful campaign. You, you can't make it work, but you can make any campaign work if you so desire. Like, just compared to all of them, even despite all the issues Ekeklaw and Frat have in terms of their initial starting positions, their campaigns end up working significantly better than Tretch's does. And besides, you're not constantly getting nuked in all the other Skaven campaigns, whereas in Tretch's campaign you are. There is kind of a bit of bug with his faction benefit with the Declaration of War, because you can basically have it perpetually on, but even then it's not as big of a benefit to make it worth it, I would argue. Uh, then we have Lewin Leonkur as Bretonia. Like, Lewin is great to confederate because he's really powerful in battles. He starts with all the vows unlocked, so you don't have to worry about that, etc., etc. But actually, playing Lewin, not worth it. Um, his faction effects are not great. His starting position is pretty bad. Corona as a special settlement actually has less growth than a random generic settlement of Bretonia. It's just the worst campaign to deal with as Bretonia in a very significant number of ways, like constantly getting attacked by Norskans and Bellacor from the north, having to deal with Grom, having to deal with Musulon, it ends up being a fairly awful situation, and you're just incredibly limited in terms of this campaign as a result of it. You can make it work, but I would not recommend playing a Bretonian campaign as low, and it just ends up working pretty badly. And then we have Gorak of the Lizardmen. Well, I certainly think the Lizardmen are a weak race and have quite a few issues, Gorak just works. As for why he works, well, nuclear weapon. 
with uh, Lord Croak. There's nothing more to say, really. Well, there is more to say. He is insane in defense. He his saurus get barrier. That that's pretty crazy. No, all of his units can get barrier on the defense of it. It's it ends up being pretty damn ridiculous. He is unkillable, and he has a guy who can do AOE. Like you can literally take Gorok and Lord Croak in a battle and decimate entire legions of forces because of the deliverance of Itza combined with the legendary lord that simply can't be killed very easily. So yeah, Gorok, it can be a fun campaign even though Lizardmen aren't the greatest race to play at the moment. They're, they work, but limitations. Then we have Teclas. Teclas, I guess the kindest thing I could say about Teclas is if you want to play a campaign where you basically have no faction effects, go play Teclas because that kind of feels like it. Or if you just want to play a really powerful caster but with no special faction effects, play Teclas because that's essentially it. I mean, Teclas is a pretty powerful caster, though he's more about spamming spells as opposed to having like something like the Flames of Asgore or other incredibly powerful spells like the Deliverance of Itza. It does work, but like right now, Teclas is the worst High Elven campaign, and honestly, the one I would like if people are asking me, oh, which High Elven camp campaign should I play? Like, I would get list off a number of reasons why you should play every single one of them, except Teclas. Teclas's campaign is absolutely not worth playing. The only reason I'm not ranking him lower is that he's still pretty decent, and he's still a High Elven Legendary Lord. Like, it's literally the race that keeps him in the game. Arriving at C tier, we start off with Grumbrindle. Now, Grumbrindle could be considered an S tier Legendary Lord in isolation, but the problem is he's still a Dwarf Legendary Lord, and Dwarves are just a really bad race. But Grumbrindle is a good Lord, he's just a really good Lord for a really, really bad race. You can enjoy his campaign in the short term, where his personal effects, the Living Ancestor effects, really make that campaign work. But in the long term, he's actually going to have a lot of issues because of his isolation, geographic isolation, compared to his fellow Dwarves. Um, and as I said, the dwarves are just limited, limited economy, issues of recruitment, issues with armies, and so on and so forth. Issues with grudges. Though Grumbrindle, when Warhammer 3 Mortal Empires came out, was actually the most playable dwarf back when the beta came out of Immortal Empires spe specifically, where uh, the grudges would just increase the severity by quite a lot very, very quickly. By the way, Grumbrindle is a good lord for a poor race. Uh, then we have the cult of Sotek, or Tenuan, um, over here. Now, the Lizardmen, not that great of a race, in a similar vein to Grumbrindle. Though, to be fair, they are better than Dwarves, but Grumbrindle is just a better lord over here. But still, the cult of Sotek does get significant faction effects through the sacrifices that they do make. He's not the best in combat or really the best lord in general, but the faction effects do make this campaign work quite quite a bit well. A bit of a disappointment having to deal with really significant Saurus upkeep from the start and not even having Saurus at the start, especially since you start very, very close to Lord Scroll, where yeah, kind of having Saurus there from the very start would have made a world of difference in this particular campaign. But outside of that particular problem in the campaign, the Cult of Sotek is certainly um, a powerful faction uh, to play for the Lizardmen. Just limitations early on in campaign, kind of a bit of a difficult start. And you're also going to have to jump in to the Saturn castways to go save uh, Axiatl. But if you do manage that, if you do manage the Lustrian situation, it can work out pretty well. If basically you win all of the early game and mid game, you can have a decent campaign. Yeah, that's why he's C tier. Uh, then Boris Ursus. Like, I think Boris Ursus is a formidable Legendary Lord, but like Grumbrindle, he's a formidable Legendary Lord for a pre poor race. He has one of the best starring armies in the entire game flat out, like with two uh, Bear Riders, two Tsarguard, two Armored Cossars, a priest. So he's off to a great start. His starting position sucks, but really. If it was just starting position lord defects and all that, yeah, then Boris Ursus could be considered an ATR, maybe even a bit higher than that. But Kislev is still a pretty crappy race, similar and similar to the dwarves. Well, not quite as bad as the dwarves, but Boris Ursus is not quite as powerful as Grimbrindle. And Kislev does have 
a lot of issues in their campaign at the moment. The Border Services is the best Keyslev Legendary Lord by far. Like, if you're going to play a Keyslev campaign, my recommendation is unlock Border Services for a mod or for Realms of Castle. I've done a whole guide on that. And then play his campaign in Mortal Empires. It will end up being far better than playing either Castalton or Katrin at the moment. Uh, then we have Krokgar. I mean, not much really to say about uh, Krokgar. He's not completely terrible. He has a pretty decent campaign, but like he's, I guess you could say he's close to being a generic Legendary Lord for the Lizardmen because he was one of the two launch Legendary Lords, and Masmundi was like just like the special caster Lord, and I think Krokgar kind of ended up being filling the role of like the kind of generic Lord because he's basically a buffed up uh, Saurus uh, Lord. Uh, and he does have benefits for Sars. His campaign, uh, his campaign works minus the whole. Yeah, let's go to the Siren Castways to have to deal with Kairos. That is fun, not really. Uh, but outside of that particular problem in his campaign, it is actually a pretty functional campaign. Problem is with Lizardmen. It's not really an issue of the Legendary Lord in this case. It's more of an issue like he's not offering anything special or special enough to overcome the major disadvantages that the race. Uh, that the Lizardmen race do have. Uh, then we have Cetra, the Imperishable. Cetra has a brutal early game campaign. And if you do overcome that, if you do endure past like 15 turns to get the second army, if you do get to a higher level settlement, if you deal with Scarbrand, if you deal with Arkan, if you deal with Manfred, basically, if you deal with all the early game, you can start steamrolling the campaign because that's how the Tomb Kings are designed. The problem with Cetra is not necessarily his lord defects, his campaign power. Like, his starting position is pretty terrible, let's be clear on that. It's it's a great province, but it's very exposed on all sides. Um, but the issue with Cetra is, like, the Tomb Kings right now between the Books of Nagash, the limited armies for a good amount of turns, they just end up suffering significantly in their campaigns. So it's not really a case like, oh, Cetra is a bad lord. No, Cetra is a good lord. But he's not so good enough to elevate his race in the portion of the game that does actually matter, which is the early game for the Tomb Kings. Because mid-late game, Tomb Kings are not going to have an issue. If you do have an issue in a Tomb King campaign past the mid-game, like once you've got the multiple armies, then that campaign is utter rubbish. Cetra doesn't have an utter rubbish campaign but in the mid-late game, but he does have a pretty awful early game campaign. Uh, then we have Malagor of the Beastmen. The Beastmen... Like, all the Beastman Legendary Lords are kind of in the same boat with the exception of Tarax. And the only reason Tarax is a bit above them is because Tarax just steamrolls with the unlimited movement points that he does uh, get. Or relatively unlimited. There is a limit to how much you can go. But you can get a signif you can cover a significant difference, difference if, uh, distance if you're playing as Tarax. As Malagor, you're kind of like in the safe starting, safe starting position, comfortable starting position where you don't have any major opponent that's going to threaten you really. So you can uh, spend your time building up Dread. Like it's actually very difficult to attack his location where he starts unless you're like your Dwarf or Greenskin or Skaven. Like um, if you can't use Andre, it's actually fairly difficult for his initial Hearthstone to be attacked. And while the Beastman early game armies are pretty bad, um, he will certainly annihilate the zombies and the top knots, the savage orcs that he starts at war with. And then he gets a major dread uh, benefit to heroes, which is actually pretty good for the beastmen. Uh, then we have uh, Kalida. Her starting position is much better than Cetra, though she likely will end up in a war with... Um, with Forrick pretty quickly, and while Forrick is not the great Legendary Lord to play at the moment, he certainly is able to build up a pretty formidable army that will pose a significant challenge in your campaign. Like, I would say her biggest issue is really that, that, you know, she should ally Forrick, but right now you're kind of in the situation where you have to fight the war with Forrick, a pretty pointless war, I might add, for a book of Nagash. Like, you could avoid it, you could take your time, you could build up, etc., etc., um, and then deal with Forek, deal with the Skaven, make an alliance maybe with uh, Krokgar, make that work, go deal with Quake. It is a campaign that works, it's not as terrible as Cetra, but she's not as good in the late game as Cetra is either. And besides, she's not as cool as Cetra either. Uh, then we have Mogur. Now Mogur, like Malagor, starts in a fairly comfortable uh, position. 
though he can be attacked pretty early on in his campaign, like his initial hurt zone can be attacked pretty early on in his campaign, so you need to be a bit careful about that. Uh, but he does get this cast spawn um, unit capacity benefit, which is actually a pretty significant early game benefit in his campaign. The downside that would say in Mogur's campaign is like the others just have better faction effects. While they might have the more difficult campaigns overall, like Targ has a much more difficult early game than Mogur, I would say Targ has a lot more uh, late game potential than Mogur uh, in a particular um, in a campaign. Then we have Nakai. Nakai can be great if you're if you're interested in playing a campaign with just like one army, because multiple armies for Nakai won't work very well. And there's going to be quite a few issues with expanding across a vast array of territory as Nakai. You might be surprised. But you are playing a horde army and it is vulnerable to destruction. You are going to have limited armies. Your income is tied to basically the garrisons that you're building up as you're taking over settlements. There are quite a few benefits. I'm not saying it can't be a fun campaign, but it is still a limited campaign. That didn't necessarily make that much sense. Even Warhammer 2 doesn't necessarily work that well. Like, look at Nakai's situation. They literally had to shove him in a corner for his campaign to work in any way. Yeah, that's not a great legendary lord. Like, when you literally get shoved in a, in a superb starting position and you still have problems, yeah, it's not a great campaign. And then finally, we have Kazrak the One-Eye. Now, Kazrak actually has quite a bit of potential. He can build up a significant amount of marks of ruination. He can build up a lot of dread. He probably he has the hardest turn one, um, turn one uh, start of any Beastman campaign uh, because he does have to attack a Wood Elven settlement. He has to fight a Field Bell. Then the settlement Bell is pretty brutal. I'm not going to lie about that. But at the same time... Um, when you're looking at Kazrak, like if you overcome that, then you have Carl Franz trying to attack you again and again and again and just losing armies, building you build marks of ruination pretty quickly in this campaign, and you do start steamrolling with that. Like that this is the you know norm though for the beastmen. Uh, but like I would say when it comes to like a full long beastman campaign, it's like the others are just much better suited for it. I mean, Kazrak isn't bad because of his... Uh, like, he, he's not bad at all, but I think Mandalore Gaming put it the best. He's the campaign you might play when you're learning to play Beastman. He's not the campaign you play once you figure out how to play Beastman. Though, <laughs> in Warhammer 3, he's probably the worst to start to start to learn Beastman. Like, I would say Mogur. Like, if you're a new player trying to figure out Beastman, maybe Mogur or Malagor would be a much better fit for that. Uh, not poor Kazrak, really. Uh, not poor, poor Kazra, because, yeah, it is a pretty difficult uh, turn one uh, situation uh, to deal with in that uh, campaign. So we've gone from S tier to A to B to C, and now we are on to D. So first off, I will introduce Marcus Wolfhart on D tier. If you're going to play an Imperial campaign and the Empire is pretty terrible, I would recommend Marcus Wolfhart. The reason is, even though the hostility meter is pretty terrible to deal with, he does gain a great deal of power through Imperial supplies, which will give him high-level units. You can get great swords, you can get huntsmen, you can get cannons and Hellstorm rocket batteries pretty quickly in your campaign, far, far faster than any other legendary lord of the Empire, which gives him significant advantages. On top of that, he has... Four special heroes, I wouldn't call them legendary heroes because they're not legendary heroes, but he does have four special heroes in his campaign that he can get access to pretty quickly. So that is a good amount of power, and right now I think he is the best Imperial campaign, even if it is still overall pretty terrible, it's just not as bad as the other Imperial campaigns at the moment in the game. Uh, then we have Nakari. Yes, Nakari is going to be in D tier. Some people rank Nakari a lot higher. Personally, I think Sonesh is really, really weak. Don't get me wrong, I think Nakari's campaign can be a great deal of fun for like 30 turns as you're fighting the entirety of Ulfwan and trying to conquer it, and then you can steamroll the entire campaign map. That doesn't make it great, however, because you end up in that situation where with Nakari, because of the poor casualty replenishment, not so great economy, you're going to have a lot of issues in this campaign. Sure, the vassalization can uh, make it work in a lot of ways, and it is a campaign that can work. That's the crucial part of it. It's not complete and utter misery throughout, 
but I do feel that demons right now are in a pretty bad spot, which is, hey, this is why Creative Assembly is going to start reworking them. Like, you look at the DLCs, that the two DLCs that we know that are going to come out this year, one in summer, one in December, pretty much, uh, they're reworking two of the demonic factions already in the game. The two worst, Siege and Nurgle, but I do expect both Sunish and Korn to also be reworked. Speaking about Korn... Yes, I would also introduce Scarbrand at D tier. Oh, but Scarbrand is an S tier Ledger in Lord. Why? Because he can win battles. I'm going to say this out loud. You can win battles as any freaking Ledger in Lord. And, oh, but you can win battles faster than anyone else. Okay. If you enjoy a campaign where the way to optimize your Ledger in Lord is to fight a hundred different battles throughout the entire campaign, great. I know there are people who, who are like that. I am not like that, because I think that the vast majority of battles that are in a campaign are utter rubbish. They're not fun, they're not engaging, they don't require any critical thinking. And Skarmorant is very much the kind of campaign where the ba the tactics you're using in battles are very simplistic and very, very boring. Oh, enjoy cycle charging Skarmorant in battle after battle, or just literally building an entire stack of Chaos Warriors and ch for hur hurling them at the enemy. So it is not a great campaign it's it's a one pony trick the trick does work to be clear the blood toasts do work the movement range they get after raising settlements does work but it is a fairly limited campaign all the same and not really a great design one i understand why people like it like it is fun to uh sometimes you know just throw an entire stack or a dozen stacks at the enemy and just wipe them out but again it's just one trick that he's got obviously if you will not build a massive empire on the campaign map he's always going to rely on just sacking and looting settlements and raising settlements for income he's not going to generate any kind of income he's not going to hold a lot of territory and you're not really going to recruit any of the good interesting units of corn like you want to play a better corn campaign pay fuck it you get all the same units <laughs> that scarbrand does have and point the fact you'll generally get more of those units because shockingly enough you can actually recruit them whereas if you're playing scarbrand yeah you're basically like, like your entire campaign more or less is going to be playing with like units that you can recruit very early on because building higher level settlements is just not something you can easily do in this campaign or even if you do it, it is pretty awful to try and actually build a an empire as scarbrand on the campaign map you can win it in a short number of turns, quote unquote, uh, but you're probably going to actually spend a lot more time playing this campaign than many other campaigns in the game, at least if we're talking about any high difficulty. Uh, then we have Aranessa, who I view as being the best legendary lord of the Vampire Coast. Now, the ba Vampire Coast is a pretty awful race, but the reason they're an awful race is, yes, you have powerful army abilities, yes, you have powerful magic, Okay, if you don't have it with the Legendary Lord, and you shouldn't really build up magic on the Legendary Lords, I think it's always better on the Legendary Lords to either focus on their melee potential or to focus on their army potential, like their army skills or the blue line. Not magic, like magic get that on heroes, right? But the thing is, while certainly the Vampire Coast has that, they are incredibly limited in terms of their campaign, their economy, which is something that does affect Aranessa. Holding a lot of territory, especially for territory that isn't por aren't port settlements, is incredibly limited. Now, Aranessa's starting position is, is such of such an age chart that she actually does have a lot of ports next to her. Like, the best thing you can do as Aranessa is like, yeah, you defeat Tylea, sure, but then you sell that territory to Ikakla, make an alliance with him, maybe put up a pirate cove if you so want to, um, in some of that, but then you head over to beat up Rapunz and Ark in the Black, because guess what? There's a lot of ports in that particular area. But the important bit here with Aranessa isn't just like the campaign situation. Like we could like Noctilus as an amazing campaign situation because he starts like with this element in the middle of the map and has a lot of flexibility on the campaign map. No. What is important with Aranessa is that the Vampire Coast, the biggest issue beyond just their limited economy and the fact that their hero capacity can only be increased by Pyre Coves, etc. The biggest issue is that the Vampire Coast unit roster with except like Depth Guard and Artillery is utter rubbish. Like their entire infantry line with the exception of Depth Guard is rubbish. Their monsters, yeah, they can work, but they're really, really ex expensive. And you can say, oh, Necrofix, Colossi, and Depth Guard. You're talking about a race that has a limited economy and you want to argue about units that cost 300 per turn. 
This is the reason Arnissa is good because she has the Sartosa Free Company. Now, Sartosa Free Company aren't great units overall, but they're kind of on the same level as Hobgoblin Cutthroats, and Cast Orbs use those just fine in their campaigns, which actually achieve a lot in the early game. So, Arnissa actually has an army. An army of units that don't have the piss poor leadership of the undead units that won't crumble, so you won't lose them all after a battle. So you, you can go from battle to battle and actually fight. So she's better not resolved. She's actually better with her army battle. Okay, she doesn't have the same instant death of magical ability as Silostra, for instance. Okay, that's fair enough. But actually having good armies, and it's not just one army that RNSI has, and this is the important thing. I don't care how good one army a legendary lord can ha have, I care about how good they can have it in 10 armies. And Aranessa will have a much better in 10 armies than either Noctilus or, or Silostra. In Warhammer 2, different situation, because Warhammer 2 was more about limited armies, and in that context it made sense. But when, or Warhammer 3, where you're trying to build up a lot of armies to conquer a significant portion of the world as quickly as possible, Aranessa is just a vastly superior choice compared to the other legendary lords of the vampire coast but i understand a lot of people are going to disagree with that that's their uh, perspective uh then we have kostaltin of kislev kislev is well, kislev is not as bad as the dwarves or the empire but it's still in a pretty bad spot if you were going to play a kislev campaign well i would recommend playing boris ursus but outside of that kostaltin is the better choice Catherine just is terrible. Not that Castalton is that much better necessarily. He still has to deal with the supporter system. He just has a better starting situation because he doesn't have to deal with the same uh, issues that Catherine has. I, I'll just give you an idea. If you're playing Castalton, you have to deal with Zazel, you have to deal with Front, you have to deal with Trog. If you're playing Catherine, you have to deal with all of those anyway, and you then have two other major issues in your campaign potentially. I say potentially because it's not guaranteed, but it very well could happen. And also Castaltin just ends up at the moment having better faction effects and lord effects than Catrin. <laughs> Poor Catrin. I mean, in Realms of Chaos, it is a completely different situation. Catrin is the by far the vastly superior choice to both Boris and Castaltin, but not in Immortal Empires. Uh, then we move on to Tic-Tac-Toe of the Lizardmen. When Immortal Empires came out, a lot of people were like praising this guy, but I think uh, time has shown that he isn't really that great. The flying units he has, yes, it okay, he does have a good amount of flying power, but flying power doesn't necessarily matter as much as you might think. Like, I would rather have a full army of Saurus or whatever the Cult of Sota can conjure up rather than just focusing on the flying units. He's also in a pretty difficult starting position where, well, not so difficult because he's not quite in the Thunderdome 2.0 over there that's happening in Camry, but he's pretty close to it and he does have issues and also his campaign ends up being awful because he, guess what, you're going to have to deal with Kairos. Yeah, that is a fun experience to have to engage in in a campaign. It's like, oh yeah, let me head over to Southern Cast Waste. It does affect the Cult of Sotic as well, but at least the Cult of Sotic actually has a lot more campaign power than Tic-Tac-Toe. Flying units, the, the issue is like, it does work to a certain extent, especially in the early game, but then like building a massive empire just like, what the other Lizardmen Legendary Lords can offer, like Gorok or Krokar or Tenuin or Axiatl, what they can offer is just vastly superior. Uh, then we have Forgrim Grudgebearer, and he's like Grumbrindle, he el helps uh, his race make up for some of its weaknesses. In Grumbrindle's case, it is the significant amount of campaign movement range casualty replenishment he's offering into his entire uh, faction. In um, Forgrim's case is the growth, the better commandments, which ultimately results in better growth. That is the significant part. On top of that, because of his Lord skill line, he is actually going to give uh, dwarves extra hero capacity, which is pretty damn useful when you're considering how difficult it is for the dwarves to get to higher level settlements to actually increase the hero capacity. So Forgrim, like if you're playing a dwarf campaign, I would say, like, Grumbrindle is the best by far and away, but Grumbrindle is limited in the fact that he can't actually reach the other dwarves. Or it will be very difficult. Whereas Forgrim, with the exception of Grumbrindle, Forgrim starts next to each other dwarves, and he does 
have uh, the ability to confederate all of them. So with Forgrim, you're not just getting like Forgrim himself. You can also get Belagar. You can also get Ungrim. They're, they're not too great to play their own campaigns, but they are worth, at least Belagar absolutely is worth confederating. So if you're playing a dwarf campaign, it's either Grum Brindle or Forgrim short term, Grum Brindle, more longer term, Forgrim. And hey, if you get the recruit to defeat the Legendary Lord's Mod, hey, you can give, even get Grum Brindle. That would be my advice if you're playing a dwarf campaign. Um, then we have Norska, both Norska and Legendary Lords. Now, this is an interesting one to talk about because if we're thinking about Trog and we're, if we're thinking about Wolfric, they're not bad themselves as legendary lords. In fact, they can, they're can they actually pretty solid. The problem is Norska is pretty busted as race, as in literally their campaign mechanics do not currently work. The monster hunts are bugged to hell. Uh, their economy doesn't make sense. The issue, another issue on top of that is the fact that when you're, like their mechanic with cast favor made sense in Warhammer 1, not so much in Warhammer 3. In the sense, you're in that problem, prob trouble spot where in Warhammer 1, obviously, you had l severe limits on which kind of territories you could take, right, in a Norska campaign outside of Norska. It's not quite the same problem in Warhammer 3, but the issue, uh, the issue for Norska is they have this uh, dynamic where they do rely on sacking uh, settlements for income, but they also want to raise those settlements to get favor with the gods in order to get campaign benefits and win the campaign. It just doesn't work because you need the money to maintain armies, but you also need to get the favor of the cast gods. And on top of that, Norska is heavily dependent right now on ports for income. And the problem with that is ports are very vulnerable. They may not attack on land across large distances, but they will attack via sea. So that makes uh, that makes defending as Norska an absolute nightmare in any campaign that you're playing as. And right now their campaigns just like, like just feel broken completely. Like it's one thing to talk about the Empire or the Dwarves or uh, any other faction uh, where they're just weak. Norska is not necessarily weak. No, they have a pretty great unit roster. The, the Dusta cannot resolve, but it's pretty powerful in the actual battles. But no, no, that's not the problem with Norska. The issue with Norska is that their campaign mechanics just don't work all that well. Or just don't work. Fly out. We have finally gotten to F tier. Now, starting off uh, here at F tier, we have Grand Hierophant Katep. Katep is an interesting legendary lord to put in F tier because he is actually a pretty good lord. Good effects, good skill line, decent enough action, right? But his campaign is completely and utterly broken. He starts in an area of the campaign map where he has a bunch of unsuitable climate which obviously is a significant issue in any particular campaign to deal with. Then on top of that, Higgs campaign victory conditions require him to travel across the entire world to get back to Camry and fight Cetra. If you're going to play the Tomb Kings, don't play Katap. It is, simply put, a fairly broken campaign. The victory conditions don't make sense. The books of Nagash are terrible. The overall situation he has to deal with in his campaign is just awful. I guess the kindest thing you could say about Katep is that his campaign is not pure misery if you decide to ignore your victory conditions, which is not an ideal uh, situation. Then we have Belagar. Now, Belagar is brought down by the dwarves being utterly terrible as a race at the moment in the game. Belagar is a pretty powerful lord and he does have all of those lovely heroes he does start with. The problem in Belagar's campaign, I would argue, is again, climate, a lot of territory around him that's not suitable, surrounded on all, all, uh, on all sides by foes. So you've got Aphalorin, you've got the Skaven, you've got Sartosa, you've got Scrag, you've got a lot of foes. You could deal with them, but you are very limited, far more so than regular dwarves are in a campaign because of the major upkeep uh, downside that you do have in um, in your campaign until you uh, get back Carrick Eight Peaks. It is a pretty annoying thing to have to deal with 
if you are playing as Belagar. I'd say Belagar is much better to confederate than he is to play. Like, if you want to get Belagar in your campaign, play a foreground campaign and eventually confederate Belagar. He's quite very durable when controlled by the eye. In fact, out of all the dwarven factions, it is Belagar that has the highest survivability of all of them, surprisingly. So, uh, then we have Lord Mazdamundi. Mazdamundi is, well, his faction effects are pretty much non-existent. His Lord skill is fairly weak. He's supposed to be this extremely powerful magic user, but he is not. Like, Lord Croak is a really powerful magic user for the Lizardmen. Mazdamundi leaves a lot to be desired in terms of either his combat ability, his skill line, his lord effects. I mean, he does get that benefit to Temple Guard, sure, let's not discount that because it doesn't matter. But he has the hardest of the Lizardman campaign because of the starting enemies he has to deal with. Uh, he has, and overall, like if you're playing Mazda Mundi, sure, if you overcome the early game, if you conquer all of the territory near you, you can become pretty powerful, but you're just going to have the most limited campaign of the Lizardman. I kind of feel that Creative Assembly made a mistake when they introduced Mazdamundi as one of the starting Legendary Lords of the Lizardman, because as they further refined the Lizardman with the LCs, they were able to do a much better job with them. Uh, then we have Volkmar the Grim for the Empire. The Empire is a pretty bad race, and obviously this does uh, get reflected in Volkmar's campaign. On top of that, he has to deal with the Books and the Gash to get the same kind of benefits that the other legendary lords like uh, Karl Franz and Gelt can get in their campaigns for the Electricons. He has to do it for the Books of the Gash. The problem is the Books of the Gash system does suck, and it's one of the main campaign systems that Volkmar is actually going to have to engage in. He also has a very difficult starting situation, again, exposed on all sides to op opponents, and he doesn't necessarily have the tools to succeed against those opponents. His starting province actually is pretty terrible for him. Then we have Forek. Forek is a really powerful lord in battle with his own army, and he can get some pretty sweet effects through the relics, for the artifacts he's picking up. But the problem is, Forek is limited in his campaign, because you do want to get those artifacts. The problem is, the way you get those artifacts is you basically build an empire that's very exposed on all sides because you're conquering the mountains and you're just and you just end up with this territory with this um with this empire that you're building that's going to be fairly exposed and defensible and you're not going to have the tools to properly deal with all the myriad of foes that, that you have like forks army will probably swat aside any army that he encounters but the problem is maintaining a second or even third army to handle things is going to be fairly difficult. Uh, say what you all about Forgrim or Grumbrindle. The reason their campaigns can work is that their territory is defensible. Forex territory, like he has Manfred and Cetera to the west. He has Kalida to the east and uh, Krokar, who likely is going to declare war on him. Then you have the Wood Elves that are likely going to declare war on him. Then you've got Queek. To deal with to the north lots of issues in this campaign and it just ends up being pretty awful to actually play as a result of that because you just kind of feel like there's perpetual fires that you need to put down like he had the worst dwarven campaign when immortal empires came out just because of his grudges he has the most amount of grudges to deal with and you're going to spend the entire campaign trying to deal with those grudges to reduce the severity to a level that some other legendary lords can get to early very early on in their campaign or that they start with that's how bad forek is uh, then we have Tsarina, Ka uh, Catherine of Kislev. In Realms of Chaos, she is the best Kislev legendary lord by far, but in Immortal Empire, she is the worst by far. See, Boris Ursus has a lot of flexibility in his particular campaign. He can expand across a good amount of territory. He can find it in Chaos Waste if you so desire, but the smarter thing is to go for the Frozen Landing, all that. Uh, Kostaltin. He does have to deal with Azazel, Frat, and Trog, but he can. Katrin has to deal with Azazel, Frat, and Trog, because Castaltin, controlled by Ajax, certainly won't. She has to deal with the supporter system, like Castaltin, which is a pretty awful system. It's like, oh, we had the Paris and Hector system in a Total War Sire Troy. Let's try and implement that somewhere in more Hammer Free. It ended up working very poorly. Her short campaign victory condition takes a very, very long time to achieve as a result of that. 
her Lord skill line is quite terrible. So her magic is not that great, and the benefits she gets for the Lord skill line aren't that great either. And on top of that, she lacks the melee skill line. Like, you want to think of a powerful caster, because there are powerful casters. Powerful casters, you could consider Drazov. He has really powerful spells, but he also has the melee skill line, so he's good in both areas. Catra lacks that. She's not great in melee. She's not great as a magic user. A hero, like getting an, a Frost Mage or a Tempest Mage in her army will, res will give you much better magic than anything Catrin can provide. So she's not in a great situation in her campaign. Both Castalton have better, uh, both Castalton and Borsursus have better faction effects, lord effects, and are better in battle. Plain and simple. So Catrin is terrible. Uh, then we have Balthazar Gelt and Karl Franz for the same reason. Imperial Authority is a pretty busted system. It never was that great in Warhammer 2, and Warhammer 3 is absolutely terrible. They're they have a fairly limited campaign start because of it. Their campaigns both feel pretty terrible. Gelt is just slightly better in Karl Franz because you can colonize the mountains, whereas Karl Franz can't. But overall, both of their campaigns feel pretty atrocious to play in Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires, which is... Kind of shame because, like, when we look back at Warhammer 1, the Empire was a pretty good race, but now the Empire is one of the worst races to play in the game at the moment. Uh, the reason is it takes a very, like, the Imperial roster is very weak early on. Their late game roster is decent, just decent. I mean, they're much, much better late game units than what the Empire has to offer, but you can make it work in the late game. In the early game, that is a major issue to have to deal with the severe weaknesses that the Empire has across the board, be it in their infantry, their range units, their lack of artillery until tier 3. Cavalry is pretty good, but cavalry in an era where you have a lot of provincial capitals to deal with, it's not going to cut it. So the Empire, pretty broken uh, race to play, and this is certainly reflected in both Balthazar Gelt's campaign and Karl Franz's campaign. Pretty big shame, as I see it. Then we have Ungram Iron Fist. Ungram is the worst of the Dwarven Legendary Lords by far. His main, one of his main Lord skills, Journey's End, actually doesn't work for Slayers. And apparently, like modders have been able to get it to fix that in order for it to work. Uh, it is a known issue that Creative Assembly is looking to fix. But Ungram just doesn't work because his Slayers just die too quickly and even then even if you're using slayers you're only going to use slayers and ungrim's own army and it's just not worth it overall like if you're playing the dwarves the best army to use in warhammer 3 is to get um a quarreler artillery army that is the best army by far Ungr so ungrim just ends up playing like a generic lord like consider all the other dwarf legendary lords, Forek, Forgrim, Grumbrindle, they get major benefits that do work for that particular playstyle. Belagar as well, though Belagar is more of a ranger guy, but rangers do work as well. Ungram slayers just don't work. I mean, if you're playing Ungram, you're just going to end up basically playing like this kind of generic lord. And the sad thing is, a generic lord or a rune lord might actually be better than Ungram. Ungram can be worth confederating to give him like a quarreler army, not even a slayer army if you confederate him, but the quarreler army, because he is pretty solid in uh, Bal. Though he's kind of pathetic in dueling ability as well, like he's supposed to be this, this uh, master duelist, but in reality he actually ends up losing compared to all the other dwarf legendary lords. Like yeah, Grumbrindle is actually better in one-on-one -on -one fights than Ungram. Uh, then we have the Vampire Coast, not much really to say. The problem with the Vampire Coast Legendary Lords is that all of their campaigns suffer because of the unit roster. Like artillery, lords and heroes are good. Everything else is pretty bad for the Vampire Coast. Uh, out of the list, I would say like um, Lufer Harkon is the worst. Noctilus is the best. Silostra is in the middle ground between them. Aranessa is the best out of all of them, but of the other three... You've got Noctilus, Silostra, and Lufer Harkon in that particular order. Like, if they had a better unit roster, if their ground-based economy was better, if they weren't relying on setting up higher coves to increase hero capacity, 
you could say the Vampire Coast would be better, but the, the Vampire Coast absolutely needs a rework, and that's why these Legendary Lords are F tier. The race does matter. Speaking about race mattering, you then have the Ogres. Ogres also are fairly limited. Like, Ogres were not really that great even in Realms of Chaos, and certainly in Immortal Empires with a bigger scope, they don't end up being that much better. Uh, Scrag is in a better situation than Greasus, even but he has one less camp. Like that's one of the advantages of of uh, Greasus. But Scrag is a better combatant, far better combatant, and he doesn't ha have quite the same awful starting position as Greasus. But both of them end up being fairly terrible at Jerry Lords, regardless, uh, regardless of that, just because yeah, ogres are pretty terrible at the moment. Then we have Kairos Fate Weaver. Kairos's campaign is terrible because Tsinch, again, is a really poor race. Uh, limited casualty replenishment, a unit roster that's dependent on the Warriors of Chaos DLC, or rather the Champions of Chaos DLC, in order to work properly, and I can go on. Uh, and while Kairos is certainly powerful as a magic user, the economy he has is limited. You have a guy who starts in one of the safest starting positions in the game and the starting cast wastes, and whose only major opponent is going to be Oxyatl. But even the minor demonic factions can give Kairos a run for his money. Like you have a Solanishi faction that has a pretty powerful garrison, you fight that Solanishi faction, you're going to end up uh, struggling against that just, just as a starting uh, situation just kind of a starting situation to tackle as Kairos, and things don't get much better later on. If you do conquer the entirety of the Southern Cast Waste, you could end up in a decent enough position, but like, Tsinch just doesn't work very well. It doesn't work very well for Demons, it doesn't work very well for Warriors of Chaos either. It's the weakest of them all right now. The magic is good, sure, but like the faction effects for both Kairos and Village are pretty terrible. Uh, then we have Kugaf. <laughs> Poor Kugaf. Beyond the major issues that Nurgle has as a race right now, or a faction at the moment, as a demonic faction, the real issue is that Kugaf is screwed so badly by his starting position uh, because that starting position, you're, you're going to have to deal with Gorst, pretty early on, potentially, then you've got Emmerich, then you've got Cafe, and those factions, those legendary lords are quite capable of wiping you out on their own, and even if you overcome that, you're just, you've just got the fairly limited campaign, economic issues of all sorts, arguably the worst demonic economy uh, in the entire game, because you have to spend a lot of money up front for every single structure that you build as Kugaf. Then finally, the Demon Prince. I mean, I think the Demon Prince doesn't even qualify as a legendary lord at the moment because, well, Warriors of Chaos can basically get Demon Princes at this point, and they might actually be better because you can give them items. You can't give this guy items. You don't have a research tree. Uh, your economy is terrible. Your unit roster isn't that great. You're just screwed over in virtually every single way that counts. He's not great in battle. He's not great on the campaign map. The Demon Prince is like a failed experiment by Creative Assembly. And to be quite blunt about it, I really don't think he is worth even talking about right now as a Legendary Lord. That does leave the Wood Elves and Warriors of Chaos, but I'll talk about them in a separate video because I think given the way those races work, uh, you they are so different and so far ahead of everyone else that uh, I think talking about them in a separate video is worth it. The Wood Elves and the Warriors of Chaos are difficult to rank on a regular tier list because, on one hand, the races themselves are really powerful, though they are boring to play. On the other hand, the Legendary Lords are very powerful, largely because of the race, but not just that. Individually, they're also very strong, sc very scary to deal with on the campaign map if you're playing with them. But that doesn't mean that they're great or that their campaigns are great. So I'm going to put them in a separate tier list, from all the, less, uh, all the rest, and I'm going to do it based on how well their campaigns are designed, how fun their campaigns are designed, because you can have a Legendary Lord that's ex extremely powerful, and he's out of crap to actually play. Now, this is something that some people can't understand, can't grasp, but this is something that does matter for 
a very substantial number of players. Anyway, so first off, in terms of these campaigns, Bellacor at Estir. If you're going to play a Warriors of Chaos campaign, the best campaign to play as the Warriors of Chaos, hands down, is going to be Bellacor. The reason is, he's very powerful, he can confederate all the other legendary lords, so I think you need to own the DLC, can't do it if you don't own the DLC, because I've seen comments from people who are unable to do it, I think that might be a DLC restriction. Uh, but either way, you do have a great deal of power with Bellacor because of the confederation, his starting position is powerful, he gets two vassals on that tiny little island, so that island is defensible, he is strong in battle, he gets a demon upkeep benefit, he can upgrade demons in his campaign, so he has a lot of strength overall to play with. And on top of that, he is able to make portals around the world. He starts with two already made, or well, rather three, because he has one in Albion itself, but he has one in the Ostmark and one in the Southern Castways that he can go to very quickly in his campaign, and then he can build more portals throughout the course of his campaign. He also starts with all of the demonic gifts of Chaos unlocked, so that gives him even more campaign power. Very powerful Legendary Lord and can be can have a fairly fun and flexible campaign. Uh, then we have Durfu of the Wood Elves. Like, I think that with the Wood Elves, there's certainly some very fun campaigns to be played, but there's something special about Durfu being a walking nightmare that has wall breaker for his uh, for his treatment, an ancient treatment. So his lords and himself, they have the wall breaker ability. They can smash down walls. Yeah, that is kind of hilarious when you just attack an enemy uh, settlement with, uh, with your ancient treatment and just break down walls. You don't need any kind of siege in this particular campaign. Actually, having that ability is pretty useful for the Wood Elves because some Wood Elven armies or some Wood Elven Legend Lords can actually struggle in sieges largely because of the lack of siege options. Like, you don't have artillery as the Wood Elves. Durfu being able to bust down walls like he does it gives him an incredible amount of power. He can also confederate easily, confederate the, uh, far more easily than the others anyway, can confederate all the other legendary lords of the Wood Elves, granting him even more campaign power. And one of the things I have realized playing Wood Elven campaigns more and more in Warhammer 3 is actually starting near the Oak of Ages is quite important because there's things you need to do in order to stabilize the situation around the oak regardless in every campaign. And if you're starting away from that, you're kind of distracted by other things that are happening. Now, you do want to travel around the world, uh, but you do want to also stabilize the oak. So Durfo has a lot of campaign potential because of his faction effects, uh, because of his um, his confederation ability and his actual start position. Well, starting position, not in the sense that starting a war with Karak Norn and having to deal with the Grey Mountains is fun. It's not, but rather just overall in the Oak. Uh, then we have Valkia, A tier as the Warriors of Chaos. Not quite as good as Bellacor, but still very powerful Legendary Lord. She's incredibly uh, difficult to take down in battle. Uh, being a Cornate Legendary Lord also gives her quite a few advantages in terms of sacking benefits, post-battle loot, raising settlements. And crucially, because of her starting position, she is in such a situation that she can easily confederate quite a few factions and earn a, earn a biblical amount of money because she can confederate a lot of Dark Elven factions. The interesting thing about Dark Elves is they can earn a ridiculous sum of money in their campaigns, even the minor factions. So I'm not just talking here about Malekith or Helebron. I'm talking here like the initial faction you start a war with, Grand which can earn like thousands and thousands of gold. That means money, that means, you know, that, that means armies, that means a lot of more campaign flexibility. And the Dark Elves are actually pretty damn powerful as vassals as well. And you have a lot of them that you can vassalize uh, next to you. Make your way down to Maravi, vassalize her as well, and then steamroll the campaign map. It is a bit awkward to get your second Dark Fortress in her campaign, to be clear, but she does have a ridiculous amount of power that she has available in her campaign. She gets movement range after battles, or rather after taking out settlements. Uh, 
but she's kind of like a mini Scarbrand in a campaign, but she is much, much better than Scarbrand as a coronate character. Uh, then we have the Sisters of Twilight. The Sisters of Twilight have the following advantages in their campaign. Like I would say Durfu is just better to play. Uh, their starting position is kind of annoying to deal with. Like once you've played a couple of campaigns, you realize that, yeah, her, their starting position is not as great as you once realized. But they have a couple of advantages. One is that they make a third army viable, very viable and very powerful for the Wood Elves. And that's the Hawk Rider army. The Hawk Riders, when you're playing the Sisters of Twilight, will get a cruise missile. That is incredibly powerful. And this cruise missile starts with one, uh, one ability usage and you can increase it to two for all armies. For more, the Sisters of Twilight can also build pretty powerful items in their campaign through the Forge of Thief as well. And they're a walking artillery piece. I mean, walking artillery piece in the sense that how they handle units, not in the sense of siege, but they are flying, sorry, flying artillery piece. They are incredibly powerful because they're the cruise missile faction ledgering lord. So incredibly powerful, very durable, flexible, uh, Quite flexible. Flying, um, flying lords, or rather, uh, legendary lords that focus on flying units don't necessarily do extremely well in a legendary campaign. Multiplayer is obviously its own thing, but like the Sisters of Twilight are pretty damn scary to actually have to face uh, in battle because of their uh, effect. Uh, then we have at B tier, we start going into. The ones that have limitations in their campaigns, I mean, Valka already does, of course, but um, limitations, we have Colex on here. The only fun thing I would say about Colex campaign as a Warriors of Chaos, like he is pretty powerful. He can get even more so with a lot of vassals. But what's fun about this campaign is the fact that you can vassalize Grimgor pretty early, far more quickly than the other legendary lords of the Warriors of Chaos, and then unleash Grimgor as a green tide. Like, you want to see Grimgor at its peak. It's not when you're allying him, it's not just letting him do his own thing in a campaign, it's actually vassalizing him because you can make, give him a focus. Because when you vassalize him, you control who you declare war on, so Grimgor can have one specific target that he's going to take out, and then you can even take control of some of his armies um, to just annihilate factions and gain a vast amount of territory. And it is hilarious playing Colic and having Grimgor as your vassal, and then Grimgor reaches uh, faction strength rank one far above everyone else, ends up being pretty damn ridiculous, all things considered. Uh, then we have Draika, also a B-tier legendary lord uh, for the Wood Elves. With Draika, I would say that Draika's campaign suffers from a lot of issues in the long term. She doesn't start to the Oak of Ages. All the other Wood Elves hate her. She only has an easy time confederating Durfu. She's going to have to fight Orion at the very least in her campaign for the Oak because she doesn't start with it. He does. Um, she does start with One Amber. She does get um, Malevolent Treekin and Treemen in her campaign, giving her an, an insane amount of power. So insane that actually facing Draika in battle is an absolute nightmare in every campaign that starts near her. Like, I, I've made this point in video after video, is that when you're facing Draika, you don't want to face Draika directly. You run around, you take her out her unit recruitment, and then you hope attrition eventually takes its toll. But it is, it is a fun campaign if you're playing in, in the short term, but for a long campaign, I would certainly not recommend it because of the limitations with Oak and diplomacy that she does have. It can work, don't get me wrong, it can absolutely work and you can have really, really powerful armies because of the malevolent intrigue, but still, fairly limited campaign. Uh, then we have Festus. Uh, Festus is certainly C, I, I think, um, in terms of campaign enjoyment, um, campaign design. You will steamroll the Empire pretty hard in this campaign, but is that really fun, just having a campaign where you just wipe the floor with everyone else, right? Like, Valka at least may have a challenge to some extent. Belliker can always seek a challenge um, in, in, in his campaign. But, like, I think with Festus, I think, like, certainly the Monogod Legendary Lords are not as great, um, are, are certainly not as great as... Um, as the undivided legendary lords for the warriors of chaos because 
while Festus gets the plague and he gets the Nurgle units, and of course he does get the undivided units, having the flexibility on the of an undivided legendary lord who gets access to all of the gods and all of their powers get grants you a lot more power. For what it's worth, I do think like Nurgle is extremely powerful of the mono gods. Though I think like Valka just ends up with a better campaign. She gets more powerful vassals. It's a lot more fun to deal with her campaign. She has better fights in that, that campaign. Uh, Festus is pretty strong, but not really all that interesting. Um, then we have uh, Sigvald. I'm gonna put Sigvald as a D tier. Honestly, I think like I could easily put him as F in terms of like player interest because I think a lot of people don't play him. Um, though Sigvald could be considered the higher ranked. Legendary Lord than um, than many others because he's still an undivided Legendary Lord. One of the key uh, one of the uh, the assumptions people make is that he's Slaneshi. He's not Slaneshi. He's undivided. So he gets all the advantages of an undivided Legendary Lord. So he gets hell cannons, all that kind of stuff, very early on in his campaign. So that is a ridiculous amount of power that Sigvald does have access to. He certainly is um, leaning towards Slaanesh, especially with his own army, but he still has a ridiculous amount of power because he is undivided. He isn't necessarily that interesting to play, however. I mean, powerful, sure, but if you're looking at Sigvald's campaign, the smarter thing is to just end up conquering a lot of the cast waste and getting a lot of vassals there, and quite frankly, that's not necessarily all that interesting uh, to deal with, but it is the smarter thing. Uh, to do than just seeking a confrontation with five plus powerful legendary lords that we would have to deal with in the West. Valka can do it, but Valka may not necessarily have to deal with Sigvald as early as Sigvald would have to deal with uh, with Valka. To be honest, he's just not as cool as Valka is. I mean, he's powerful. All of them are powerful. This is not the question of uh, power, power, but like, if I'm going to play Warriors campaign, I'd certainly play Valka in that area than uh, Sigvald. Uh, then we have Orion, absolutely an F tier legendary lord for the Wood Elves. It's it's kind of hilarious when you think about it, because on one hand, Orion, because of his faction effects, is flat out, and this is no joke, flat out the strongest legendary lord in the game, because he's playing a race, he's playing a faction that is built around having you know income and having to spend money on troop upkeep. But what happens when? You don't have to spend money because that's the thing about Orion. You declare so many wars, so many minor factions, relevant factions, that you'll literally end up having 20 plus tax for none of which you're paying for in terms of turn upkeep. Rather, all you're doing is uh, is paying to recruit them. So you end up with a ridiculous sum of money with a ridiculous number of armies and you just steamroll the world. It's still a pretty awful campaign. The start isn't that great. And as you get steamrolling, it's just, it's not fun to have zero challenge in your campaign and having such a, uh, such a level of power that, okay, it doesn't matter who you're up against, it can be an endgame crisis. You do bring 20, 30 plus armies to an endgame crisis, you're going to auto-resolve that endgame crisis. And that's the issue in Orion's campaign. Like, what you literally do is you start with a guard that takes you a long time to get to Trekin, but once you get to Trekin, you just literally spam Trekin and as many heroes as you can and all that, and throw dozens and dozens of army against any problem, and you'll annihilate the map. <laughs> That's, though not too quickly, because you don't want to do it too quickly, because you'll end up suffering significantly in terms of your economy. But yeah, it, it's just a really crappy campaign. I think that Creative Assembly hasn't known what to do with Orion to make him playable, like they gave him a significant benefit, and he's still pretty awful uh, to play. Uh, then we have... Village, also F tier of the Warriors of Chaos. His starting position, position is of such a nature that it takes a long time to get to anywhere. And that's not a fun thing to experience to begin with. Then on top of that, Cinch, um, Cinch is genuine. And like in terms of the Gifts of Chaos, Cinch is the worst. The units are pretty solid, but the actual Gifts of Chaos you're going to get from Cinch are not worth a damn, I would argue. Uh, so you do have that particular limitation, and the campaign itself just falls flat on its face. Like, yeah, powerful caster, powerful hybrid lord between caster and melee lord, actually. Uh, you do have a huge amount of barrier that is very easy to keep up. You basically can't be killed in a battle because of how his effects do work. But all the same, like, Cinch the most limited, starting position not that great ends up with an FTR Legend Lord. Uh, then we get Azazel. 
I would say that like Azazel is slightly better, like the Slashy and the Slashy end up being the um and this time around it is a dedicated Slanashi Legendary Lord. So with Azazel, it he's again a powerful like as I said, all of them are powerful Legendary Lords without exception, but how good is his campaign? Not so great. Vassalizing Kislev is not a fun experience because Kislev is pretty bad at being a vassal. Like some people have like Grimoire or they get cast dwarves to vassalize. Other people get the Pathetic Empire. I mean, maybe I should rank Festus, though to be fair, Festus does have much better faction effects because he, Nurgle beats the crap out of Slanesh. Slanesh is not quite as bad as Siege. There are some good faction effects or some good gifts of chaos and some good units um, with Slanesh, some, some decent ones, but it's not quite as good as Nurgle, though it's not as bad as Siege. But yeah, I would say like uh, when we're looking at the Zazel's campaign, having to deal with Kislev is just the entire area of the campaign map is pretty awful uh, to tackle. And then what? Oh, great. We're steamrolling the Empire again. You know, at least Festus has to deal with a dozen armies. Azazel just takes his sweet time and shows up with half a dozen vassals by the time an Empire just brutalizes all of it. Not really a fun campaign at all. And then the worst of the bunch, by far, may maybe F minus tier, is Archeon the Ever Chosen. Very powerful legendary lord, really awful campaign to play. You're gonna spend 30, 40 turns just traversing the Chaos Wastes, vassalizing and uniting the tribes of Chaos, getting Dark Fortress after Dark Fortress, Dark Fortress and then swarming across the map. It is power it is a powerful campaign without a shadow of a doubt, but it is also a horrible campaign to actually play. Because you're literally you you may only have to fight one single battle, and that's possibly against poor resources in your entire campaign, because by the time you encounter any kind of serious opposition, you've got dozens and dozens of armies to throw against that. You get major benefits for every vassal of diplomacy, research, souls benefits, so you'll get more gifts of chaos than anyone else. Uh, you'll get more allies than any any of the others over here on this list, and you'll get so many dark fortresses. You'll be sw uh, swimming in money, but it isn't a fun campaign to play. Like it's kind of a silly situation because Archon should be an interesting campaign, a very interesting campaign as you're trying to unite the forces of Chaos to smash the, over the world. The problem is because demons are so bad, and most of the factions you're dealing with are demonic factions. Uh, it doesn't end up being an interesting campaign. As I said, you will literally auto-resolve your entire campaign. Say what you will about the others, they might have at least some fights in their campaigns to deal with. Not necessarily that many. Like, you can auto-resolve the vast majority of battles in every single one of these campaigns. Maybe a couple early on. But Archeon is literally every single one of them. That is not a fun campaign by any stretch of imagination. And that's all there is to say. Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and stay tuned for more. That is with my Legendary Lord tier list. And we'll see what comes up next.